Hi. Welcome to all the people that have been waiting in the chat. Uh, we had a big show today, so it took a little bit of pre-planning to get everything set up and ready to go. I'm Paul Marco, and with me, uh, sort of co-hosting, is uh, Mindy. She's going to be working with us today, and this is going to be a great show. We've got all four of the joint investigation team. Hi, and Melanie's here. She's part of the team. Well, we have all four of the team, plus we have Melody Persia. That's how I was going to do it. Anyway, so it should be an exciting show. Some of the notes that uh, Catherine has passed to me that's going to happen here, we're going to talk about Karen's petition, and we've been trying to orchestrate being able to show that live as we go. Uh, we're going to look at a, a draft affidavit that I think Catherine's putting together. Uh, public statement about Millicent's perp. Finally, we're going to come out with this guy's name and point fingers. Uh, also, this is going to be shocking for all of you and was shocking for me in the beginning here. We're going to show you Melanie's actual implant. Uh, I was knocked off my chair when I first saw it. Uh, Catherine's correspondence uh, with the police. That's always, it's like an ongoing running dialogue we have here with Catherine and the police. I'm always anxious to catch up on that one. Uh, then, actually, I should I should say I should say Paul that that will be next week because um, okay. I didn't actually I didn't have time to upload okay. all my correspondence with the police and translate it to English. But by next week, it should be all there. And then also, I ask people to download it and include it in their own court cases as evidence of the pretty shocking aiding and abetting of crimes against humanity. Because I tried to correspond them. I mean, I tried to talk to them a year and a half ago, but now for the last two months, I've been there and. They just, they are rejecting it. And I know that all other um, victims are the same. So I will prepare my documents so that people can use it as ammo for their own cases, but not this week, <laughs> next week. Perfect, okay, that's a good, that's a good cliffhanger for next week. Uh, also revelations about the city of London. But, you know, since we're so grand packed, jam packed in this week, it may or may not happen. So just ride with us, we're gonna have a good time and, uh, why don't we start off with Karen, who has the petition. Uh, would you like to tell us about that and start us off? Okay. Um, a little while ago, I decided to write my own petition for the very first time. I had been collecting uh, a list of all of the laws that are being broken. And so I thought, well, let's, uh, I had written it into a document and then offered it to people to do with as they wanted. And then uh, Rachel, a, a friend, told me, she said, why don't you just make it into a petition? And I said, duh, yeah, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. So I put it on the White House petition site, and I also did, I believe it's uh, I petition. So there are two places for the very same um, petition. Well, I will tell you, too, that after thinking about it, this is not something I did lightly, but after thinking about it for a long time, I decided in the demands that I, that I talk about, I demanded the death penalty for the people involved. And I did it on, uh, for many different reasons. One, because I do say in, in the uh, petition that this type of mentality that, you, that your neighbor is somebody you can prey upon in order to make money, that your neighbor's life is worth a big screen TV, if you can get it. And if you can commit crimes and not get caught, then you're all too willing to kill someone for it, to kill an innocent person. And I said, you cannot rehabilitate that any more than you can rehabilitate a rabid dog. So I did demand the death penalty. And I told people, I said, I put my name at the bottom of the petition. I said, this was written by Karen Melton Stewart. And I said, not because of ego. That doesn't, you know, that doesn't matter. But my thinking was, since I am demanding the death penalty, if anybody says, oh, you're threatening, then it comes back to me and not the people signing the petition. Because the people signing the petition are very welcome to make a comment saying, I, however, do not approve of the death penalty. Be my guest. You know, I don't think that particularly undermines what I'm saying. But I worded the petition fiercely. Okay? There's no bad language. 
there are no threats. But I worded it fiercely to let them know we mean business. This ends now. Because we, and I said in the petition, because we have a right to self defense. And we are being murdered. So this is my thinking. And um, like I said, it, I hope it serves a purpose. If anybody's really just not comfortable with it, I'm not offended. You know, write your own and I will sign it. So we just need to keep coming up with things to make noise. And uh, I have been told that the petition as is um, has been given to someone who works for Congressman Trey Gowdy and that she is printing it out and taking it to him. And I would say this is a boon. He is a, con a constitutional bulldog. And I think he will not appreciate what is being done to us. But I do still encourage people, most especially, to go to the White House petition site and sign it. Because if we get 2,000 signatures, then the White House must respond. And if we get them, we need them by October 2nd, because I started the petition on September 2nd. So please consider signing it. And if you really, really don't agree with the death penalty, um, then put so. You know, just say, I, I disagree on this point. Um, my, also, my other thinking is that where are we going to get the money for thousands of new prisons? <laughs> you know, <laughs> Because if you don't put these people to death who so gladly sold your, your life for a big screen TV or a lawnmower, then how do you rehabilitate them? You can't. You must put them away for life. And if you put them away for life, you're going to need really thousands of new prisons. And that's going to cost billions of dollars for you to sustain the lives of people who so gladly wanted to kill you for a little bit of, of money or a little bit of products, you know? So that was my thinking. You know what? I, I actually really would like to support you on this because I think what has happened is that, um, I mean, first of all, all of us have seen so many horrific victim cases in addition to the ones that we are suffering ourselves. And um, I have also seen the type of person who does this, and this goes not just the people on the street who are doing this to me, and not just my neighbors, but also the government officials who are doing this. And they're all, what they're doing is they're engaged in premeditated murder, but not just any old murder. It is the most torturous um, type of death they're trying to inflict, and they are enjoying it. Now, we never had a situation since the Nazis, and we certainly didn't have a situation even during the Nazis, where globally officials and police officers and other intelligence agents and your neighbors and everybody could think that they could publicly execute and torture to death individuals and get away with it. This is a first in history. And last time anything happened that even came close, there were death penalties. But I think the problem was that in the Second World War, not very many people were executed. It was basically a handful. And I think that was a mistake because I think your your um, analogy of a, of a rabid dog is excellent because these psychopaths have tasted blood and they, they think they have the power of gods. And once a psychopath reaches that, he has to be put under the ground, I think, because nothing ever brings him back. And the people who follow these, um, these people have to see the, the example of these actually dangerous serial killers. Like, like the perpetrator who has not just um, been torturing Millicent and destroying her, her health and her life, but also has been killing many people in her community. A man like that cannot be re re uh, rehabilitated. And also, I think um, using taxpayers' money to keep him in jail for several decades is a waste of money, frankly. He's a serial killer and he should be put to death. And, um, you know, my, my problem with the death penalty is that um, in the past, there's many places times when um, they hit the wrong people, you know, um, they, they, if people were if put into entrapment operations and stuff like that. But now we have a couple of people where absolutely every evidence, you know, circumstantial actual government documents point at them as the main Nazis um, running a, a global Holocaust. And I think those people should be literally put to death forever, you know, for good. And, and the many other people who we can identify all the way down you know also low-level perps who think that they can drive cars and, and shoot people in the face and in the head with these electromagnetic weapons hidden in their car we can feel the weapons we know where the shots are coming from 
when I drove to work with Melanie last week on the motorway, people tried to kill me twice on the way there and on the way back. And both times I knew exactly what car license it was and I saw the man who was sitting in it. And I think for that, you know, for an assassination attempt, I mean, sadly in Germany, they don't have the death penalty anymore. But for example, the UK has life imprisonment. So, but you in the US, you have the life penalty, uh, death penalty, and I think you, this is the time to make use of it. That's what's there for. And I think the people who devised the legal system in the beginning, they understood this. They have seen enough wars and human cruelty to know that some people are just, you know, they just don't deserve life. No, they poison society. Mm -hmm. And there's no getting around the fact that they are themselves poison. I mean, for the Christians out there, you know, from the Old Testament, it, you know, God basically told the Israelites to take the certain land from certain people. And sometimes they just did. And other times he said, these people are so wicked. I want you to get rid of every man, woman, child, and even their livestock because they are that wicked. I don't want you to be poisoned by them. Now, that is rare, but I think we're in a time in history where we're there again. Mm -hmm. And Karen, I just wanted to say that um, even though I, for instance, just like uh, Catherine, have had reservations in the past about the death penalty, yes. I had no problem signing your petition. And um, adding a comment at the end to state that um, I'm all for, you know, these guys being jailed for life at the very least. Mm -hmm at the very least. So I kind of made a distinction, and I, and, but I signed it anyway, because I think everything that you're asking for in, in that petition is um, exactly what I'm completely in alignment with. Because it, this is absolutely horrendous. What's being done is absolutely horrendous. And I'm actually, if you guys don't mind, I'll screen share right now, just for a few seconds, just to show the petition. Um, and so everyone can see what it looks like, because we've talked about it a few times. So here it is, it's on I petitions. And uh, this is what it says, federal government, take me off your fraud enemies list now. As we all know, this is a fraudulent list. It's being set up, literally the Patriot Act is being used fraudulently to simply name anybody, anybody that the local crooks and criminals in the local law enforcement or fusion centers um, want to assault with electronic weapons. And uh, anybody is put on this list wrongfully, on this list wrongfully. And so this is a fabulous petition. Um, and I, lie, I love that Karen spelled out, I'm writing to you to demand that my name be taken off whatever enemies list, whatever this list is being called, the terrorist watch list, fake terrorist watch list, enemies list, kill list, human non-consensual experimentation list to contract, UN agenda 21 kill list, Whatever terminology they are using, I think it's fabulous that this point is stressed here, or whatever other list you have fraudulently and criminally concocted as a cover for the mass invasive, non-consensual, covert weapons testing, neurobiological weapons testing, secret illegal implantation of medical chips, and other invasive devices, which we're here to talk about today in greater length, nanotech con contamination, Morgellons contamination, radiological poisoning, food and contact poisonings, gassings, etc which by the way, refer to thousands of other people, not just people who are known as targeted individuals, everybody on the planet really, who's getting the nanotech aerosols rained down on them. So um, this is a fabulous petition. I recommend that everybody go through and read it. And um, as Karen spelled out, all of the laws that, this, uh, that these actions are trespassing on and trampling on are spelled out here. Terrorism laws, destructive device laws, torture, treason, sedition, and subversive activities, war crimes, interception of oral communications, stored wire and electronic communications, um, prohibitions on the release and use of personal information from the DMV records. Um, and then she's also spelled out the oaths of office. This is a reminder to all uh, the people in public office who actually take oaths of office to protect the Constitution and to protect American people. So these oaths of office are spelled out, the sheriff's oath of office, the judge's oath of office, the FBI oath. This is a reminder. This is a reminder to all these people who take these oaths, to keep these oaths. And... Um, 
essentially it spells out that this is a master slave program. This is a program of enslavement. People are being made into slaves. And finally, it closes with demanding the death penalty. We demand the death penalty for any and all engaged Nara souls who knew or should have known that they were conspiring to deprive us of our constitutional rights and our very lives for their own monetary gain. We further demand that a constitutional court show them the mercy they showed us, which was none whatsoever. And I'll leave you all to read the rest of it. Um, and I hope at some point to do a podcast with Karen and she will read out the whole petition herself because we need every American to hear this petition, to see the text and to understand the gravity of the situation that we are attempting to publicize. I think this is brilliant. And the one thing I would like to draw my, um, not uh, draw the attention to in the list that Karen um, actually listed, um, and that's very, very powerful. I just would like to share my screen briefly. And I would like to show you because in that list was also um, uh, you, um, so 18 US code um, um, article or paragraph 2381 for treason. And people forget this. People, not just in the US, but similar laws exist in every country. Um, the laws for treason have been forgotten, and that applies to literally every man um, and woman in the United States, but especially government officials. And here it says, whoever owing allegiance to the United States levies war against them, right? And this is a war on the civilian population, or adheres to their enemies, that applies as well, because this is all foreign funded and foreign guided, giving them aid, and comfort within the United States or elsewhere is guilty of treason and shall suffer death. So asking for the death penalty is totally within the law. Or shall be imprisoned not less than five years and fined and so on, but not less than $10,000 and so on. And shall be incapable of holding any office um, under the United States. Um, but we are asking for this because it's not just any old treason. This is also premeditated um, murder. And premeditated murder is the highest. That in itself is um, already um, incurring the death penalty. And the two combined, high treason together with um, premeditated murder, um, I think really um, means that we should ask for the death penalty and a lot of people should get it. You know, everybody who has been conspiring against the um, people of the United States or, for example, here in my case, against the people in Switzerland, or in Germany, or in Belgium, where Melanie is, or in the UK, or elsewhere. And it's high treason, and it has been forgotten that high treason is still one of the most serious offences, because it puts an entire nation into danger. And as we're now, we are being ridden into, I think, a global war, where, funnily enough, we'll be told that this is a, a war between nations, but actually each nation will be murdered by the, by the own you know, criminal scum that have been floated up into government offices and have been given directed energy weapons. And I think this is the plan. You know? The other thing I wanted to say also is that um, the ex-general uh, counsel to the World Bank, Karen Hudis, she also publicized the fact that technically the US Constitution is not in power, it's not in effect right now, and right now, um, the U.S. does not have any lawful government. It's in so-called interregnum. Um, so the U.S. Constitution has to be put back into, um, into power. It has been, I think, suspended, I, um, I think, in 1871. And has actually, the U.S. has been under martial law ever since. But the key thing is, and I think um, in, in the legal framework, we have to um, get onto this, when you have an entire nation being told, being told in school um, and being taught and everywhere being told that the constitution is in effect just because two people behind you know, closed doors sign a piece of paper doesn't really mean and should not mean that the constitution is suspended. At the moment, I think they are running these murderous operations which are entirely foreign um, coordinated um, under the illusion that um, under the um, war powers of the United States, they can they can run a war against the U.S. citizens because the Constitution does not apply, and all the codes we have read out do not apply. I think this is false. I think this is false, and I think a legal argument should be made also that um, when war powers are um, signed off behind closed doors, um, so that an entire nation is oblivious, um, it has no legal validity, absolutely none. So I think. Um, even now, arguments can be made that the Constitution is still in effect because um, the vast majority of the population adheres to it. Um, so 
um, it, it applies nonetheless. I just wanted to put in this legal caveat because I, I am pretty sure that a lot of these serial killers who are running amok and, and a lot of the um, neighbors in the US who think that they can um, mutilate people to death with electromagnetic weapons and then maybe get their property, um, I think are, are in for a big fat surprise. Because even under war powers, um, having a war against your own people, the people on your own side is still considered high treason, even more so in a situation of war. So there we are. I think the death penalty is totally, totally fair enough in the US. And I'm just sorry that we don't have it everywhere in Europe. That's all I can say. So Catherine, I think at some point we wanted to talk about two very major announcements today, right? Um, one is about um, discoveries related to Melanie's situation. And uh, the other is about um, a very important announcement in relation to Melisand. So, you know, take your pick, which one do you want to, which one needs to go first? I'll let you do it. So I actually would like to start um, briefly um, because with the, with the second one, I want to go into even more detail. I want to start um, by um, with Melanie and what Melanie and I have done last week because um, I traveled to Brussels. Um, and as I said, it was pretty spectacular because I was almost killed on the way there. Um, and I had a lot of symbolism because um, after that there was a, a hearse, you know, a car carrying coffins uh, in front of me on the on the motorway, and so on. Um, and um, I was there with uh, Melanie working with her for a week, and then I also picked up um, an implant that was taken out of her throat, and I brought it back to Switzerland <clears throat> to have it analyzed in a specialist lab. So the implant is now with me, and I would like to show the world what this looks like. Um, and I also then would like to ask Melanie to explain how this implant came to be in her in her throat. And then in the meantime, I'll bring up the actual analysis results we have from the Swiss lab, which are hugely interesting and show that this stuff is certainly not, not biological. So the actual implant that was taken out of her throat is here. It's I will try to hold it into the camera. It's this big black or these two big black pieces. They are connected on this side. So it's like a U. OK. So this was in her throat, and this thing is just half of the bit that was taken out of her throat because the bit was cut off. It was kind of cut into half this way, okay? So if you have here the size of my thumb next to it, you can kind of guess how massive this thing is, okay? This is huge, and it's totally black, and when you look into it in terms of the materials, it's mind-boggling. But that stuff was taken out of her throat. And um, as Melanie can explain now, this thing was used to strangulate her. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a strangulator put in by Belgian intelligence into a defenseless woman's throat. So Melanie, explain how this thing came to be in your throat. Oh, your microphone. I think you need to unmute your microphone. OK. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, the story of the implant. Uh, well, I cannot say exactly by whom it was done because I was drugged when it uh, when this happened. All I can say is that uh, some years ago, uh, regularly in the morning, and I was still working then uh, for an employer, uh, I woke up and I felt like I had been drugged, and indeed on my body, I. Um, could see various scars that I, you know, small surgical scars that I could really not explain. And there was also one indeed uh, on my throat. And I remember that on, regarding this particular implant, uh, because my body is actually riddled with them. Um, I went to the bathroom in the morning because before going to work and I saw, I felt a movement in my throat and I saw a lot of black little pieces like debris coming out of it and fibers and uh, and little what looked like like little metal pieces uh, very small ones and I was really scared and I had no idea what this was and I didn't know what it was but I had to go to work so I, I wasn't very concentrated uh, at work because I was thinking about this all the time um, so I suspect and later I had these scars um, uh, noted down, you know, and confirmed by a dermatologist. And I should say that during the time that um, Catherine was here now uh, last week, uh, 
she went to see the same dermatologist who confirmed the same kind of scars in the same locations where they were found also with me. So, uh, uh, so what I assume what happened or what I'm pretty sure what happened is that uh, as the um, NSA whistleblower uh, who also made a, made a trial uh, against his former employer, employers, um, Johnson Quire already stated uh, that um, the secret services uh, uh, come in at night, they drug you or they um, put a gas under your, this, um, your door so that that will knock out the victim and then come in and um, uh, do these uh, little surgical operations and implant people. Uh, why it's they're drugged. So uh, this would explain why I woke up in the morning finding these scars on my body, and uh, which was also the car uh, case here in my throat, and then there was the foreign material coming out of my skin. So what I could feel uh, the whole day I was at work was definitely something moving in my throat, which was really, um, <laughs> which scared me to death. I had no idea what this was, but I couldn't really tell my colleagues about it, and I had to do my, my work day. So um, what uh, later then, uh, once this uh, moving and uh, uh, fiber shedding had finished, uh, I more, 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 more felt strangled. So I felt definitely um, a strangulation feeling, which was getting more, more intense. And I was getting quite scared for my life. Uh, and by the way, I've also got implants in my, uh, in my ears, which have recently been, um, how do you say, well, uh, confirmed by a private investigator. And so uh, they can put voices in my, in my head with the, with the voice to skull um, technology. And I was regularly told that they would break my neck or they would strangle me. Uh, so uh, what happened then is that um, you cannot see this technology on, on a CT scan or an MRI, but you could see in my, my, my case, the effect it had produced on my hyoid bone. It's a, it's a bone uh, in a U, U form <laughs> that you have here in your, uh, in your throat. Uh, or, uh, the hyoid bone is quite a solid bone and it got more and more curved. And no doctor could explain why my hyoid bone would suddenly incurve like this, <laughs> because you only see this kind of symptoms with victims of strangulation. So I was regularly asked by the doctors, well, do you have a husband or a partner that is violent, that strangulates you? Or, and I said, no, but uh, I knew that if I talked about the technology and being gradually strangled, <laughs> uh, they would probably have not operated me or not believed me. So I just said, okay, these are the, the X-ray images. I feel strangulated, this higher bone uh, causes me a lot of pain. Uh, what can you do? So finally, the doctor agreed to cut on both sides of my hyoid bone, uh, a piece of the bone. <laughs> uh, so, so this strangulation uh, sensation was more relieved, but um, the, 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 the actual implant was still in my, in my throat. So after he had operated on my hyoid bone and probably saw what was in my throat, <laughs> Uh, he did not want to perform a second uh, operation. Uh, usually the, they will, the surgeons will touch you once, once they have seen what, is, what this is about. They realize that it's a secret research, military research project, and they will not, um, you know, touch you any further, uh, do any second operation. So uh, he had refused um, to take out this, um, uh, well, there was, the implant actually, you could feel it under my, my, my skin, and you could also, see it, uh, that there was like a prolongation. And I said, well, you know, this still is hurting me, so I would like you to remove this as well. And he said, no, 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 there's nothing now. You, you're fine. It's, everything's fine. Uh, <laughs> you know, just forget about it. I'll, I'll not, I don't give my agreement for, to a second operation. So I changed uh, the, the hospital. <laughs> I went to see another surgeon and I explained to him, it's uh, you're well advised never to say that you have an implant in your throat or, or wherever. You just say, okay, there's like a, a lump here that is um, that is uh, very disturbing, that is painful. So I, I I told him this, and he was like feeling it with his uh, fingers, and he said, yeah, indeed, there's something hard here, but uh, but I can't see anything on your on the X-rays. That's that's very strange. But he said, oh, but I feel it with my finger. Indeed, there there is something. So he thought it was a, a, um, a cyst on my thyroid. 
So he said, oh, does it really hurt? And I said, yeah, really, I really would like to remove it because I feel pain all the time. And so although he couldn't see it on the x-rays, he gave his agreement to remove it surgically. <laughs> and uh, when I woke up and he came to see me, I said, so what, what was it, doctor? He said, he looked uh, rather <laughs> embarrassed and he said, well, it's certainly not a kist. And I have sent the, what did he say? The, what I have removed wasn't very clear. I've sent it to the laboratory to have it analyzed. And uh, so uh, I went out of the hospital and then I later told him, well, I, I need the operation protocol for my insurance, you know? <laughs> So um, could you please send me this? Uh, and I had also asked for the uh, laboratory. And he only sent me the operation protocol saying that it was just inflamed tissues that he had removed. It just, you know, it was nothing. There was no kist and he just had removed some inflamed tissue. And uh, this, uh, you know, uh, surprised me very much because I knew that there was actually, um, you know, <laughs> an implant in there. So I uh, contacted his secretary and I said, well, you know, uh, thank you for the report, uh, received the re report for the doctor, but I know that he sent it in to the laboratory and I need also the laboratory report to know what it actually is. And she replied to me, well, well, uh, he told me it's not very serious. It's, it's not a serious uh, thing. You know, <laughs> so I said, well, that might be, but I do want to, to have to, the laboratory report. So she was like, hmm, yeah, how could we do this? He said, well, come on a day, on this day, because there he's not there. So I will go in his computer and take this report out. Uh, but, you know, don't talk to him about that. And, and you know, <laughs> very odd, you know, for something that was supposed to, supposed to be nothing, nothing serious or nothing grave. So that's what we did. So I, I came on that day when he was not there and she, you know, she she printed this uh, report off his computer. And the first thing that really, uh, you know, <laughs> struck me was uh, when I read that it said, a piece entirely black removed from the patient's throat. And then it gave the um, dim dimensions of the piece. And it was 3.5 centimeters times 1.5 times 1.5. So as Catherine already said, it is not a small piece at all, you know? <laughs> And uh, okay, I can believe the doctor removed inflamed tissues because if you have a foreign body in your, you know, in your tissues, it's it's quite logical that they get inflamed. Uh, but he did not tell me that he had removed this piece, you know, <laughs> which was vital information. So I took this, and then with an Ikato colleague, we decided to go to that uh, lab unannounced with this report. And uh, I said, well, you know. Dr. Ladner took this out of my throat <laughs> and uh, every, everything that is removed from my body is my property. So I would like you to, you know, uh, I would like to retrieve this, uh, this piece. And uh, they were like, oh, well, you yeah, know, but, but you should have called. Uh, now this is like really unannounced and now you have to wait very long time uh, for us to find the sample. And then there has, there is another doctor who has to sign that you, you know, you can remove it. And, and I said, that doesn't matter. I have all the time in the world, but I'm not leaving here without this piece. So, <laughs> so, so she was like, um, okay. <laughs> And it actually didn't take so so long. So maybe I waited maybe 20 minutes and then, then they arrived with it. And I signed for a receipt and uh, I took it. And I said, well, you know, I looked at that piece and I said, well, that's for sure not biological. I mean, uh, um, and uh, so we had the, uh, uh, as Catherine has uh, explained, we had the um, important task to find um, a lab that would analyze it because what we needed, it's actually, a written confirmation from you know a research facility or research lab to to confirm you know uh, that it's not biological and out of what it is precisely made so um my doctor did the one attempt uh, to send me here to the university clinic asking clearly that th this piece should be analyzed electronically by, by an electronic uh, microscope and the um the university clinic refused saying it was not necessary to do this kind of um, analysis. <laughs> and uh, so uh, 
you know, uh, when I went to pick up the piece there again, uh, I went with a colleague and we both asked the doctors, we, uh, we said, well, you know, um, how can you say, how, can, how uh, did you decide by yourself that it was not necessary, uh, despite my doctor's wishes, um, and have you had any, um, any experience with uh, nanotechnology or biotechnology that is implantable in the human body? And the doctor said, said she, she didn't. She had no experience with uh, with this, so uh, you know it's a bit odd that she herself decides that this uh, kind of analysis with an electronic microscope is not necessary. So finally, there we were. So uh, I told the situation. I told Catherine the situation, and I said, "Well, we need to find a lab who will do it." Uh, and uh, Catherine, uh, who's a brilliant researcher, found out that there was a laboratory in Switzerland that is precisely specialized in this kind of um, uh, analysis and as Catherine already mentioned, we recently got the got the the results, <laughs> and what comes out of it is that uh, indeed it is certainly not biological, and it is mainly um, mainly uh, composed of titanium. Yeah, so, actually, I uh, what I what I can do, Melanie, I have the results. Um, I can bring them up, and if you're if you're happy with that, I can actually show the results as I saw them. Um, should I show the pictures of the analysis? Yeah. So okay, idea. yeah, so um, one of the things I would like to explain what sort of test we have done because um, this, um, what has been done at this lab is called X-ray spectroscopy. Um, so you know X-rays where you're going into, you put your body, your arm, your broken arm into an X-ray. So the X-rays go through you and then they are recorded by a photographic plate. And then your bones are so dense that they absorb the X-rays. Your soft tissue is not dense, so the X-rays go through your soft tissue and you have kind of like a trace, a drawing of your bones. This is how X-ray works. Now, X-ray spectroscopy works differently. You have to sample down, and then you scatter X-rays off the sample. And these X-rays are so energetic, and the beam is so fine, that you're using a beam of 30 microns width, and you're hitting one point on the sample, and then the energy is so large in this X-ray um, and the X-ray photons that they excite the atomic levels of whatever is inside the material. What that means is if you go back to school, you probably know you have um, in an atom, you have the nucleus and you've got electrons going around. That's the image we're usually taught at school. So we, we're taught at school that it's kind of orbits. You know, it's a bit more complex, but that's a good analogy. And then what happens is that an electron inside the atomic shell gets knocked up an, elect uh, an energy level, absorbs the energy from the photon, gets knocked up, and when it drops back down to the or original energy level that it was, it re-emits an X-ray, but in a different direction from the original direction, okay? So, um, and what this allows you to do um, is that you can pick out what exact atoms, what elements are in that sample. And that's because every atom has a different weight and the, the energy levels in every atom are different. And from the precise, so it's the gaps between the two electron orbits that are very specific to every element. And um, if you then measure this, um, this photon, X-ray photon that gets re-emitted in a random direction and you measure its um, energy, then you can tell you know, what, um, what exact um, energy level has been absorbed by the atom, and therefore you can conclude what atoms are in there. Okay, so it's a lot more complex than x-rays, but now if you've understood this, um, you will understand the plots that I'm showing you. I'm just going to um, share my screen, and I will show you what happened when I went to the lab. Um, we, which one should I start with? I will start with this one, okay? So, First of all, we went to the lab and we put it into an X-ray machine, okay? And um, the X-ray machine, um, so you kind of put the sample in a little glass tray and the surface of the sample looks like this, okay? But it's, it's magnified by 70, by a factor 70, okay? So that's what the sample looks like. And already you can see it's very unusual because there are these dark blobs and then there are these white lines, okay? and these white bits here and there. And you can see it's not just on top, but these white dots are all throughout the sample. Okay, so then this little red circle, which you probably can't see, but it's right there. That is the size of the X-ray beam. And um, we hit the sample on this point, and then this big red structure here is the um, energy distribution of what was scattered back at an angle, at a random angle away from the main beam line, okay? 
So what you have to do with this is you have this bump, okay, this big bump that all these other humps are sitting on, and you have to subtract that in your mind because that's just, you know, an elastic scattering spectrum. So forget it. What's important is these bumps, okay, this bump, that bump, and all the other bumps. And you can already see that every bump has been um, labeled with the name of an element, okay? So this thing, this double hump here, ignore that because that comes from the, the source that's emitting the x-rays, okay? That's just um, specific to the um, emitter. So ignore these two humps, but all the other humps, this one here, for example, stands for um, sulfur, okay? This is calcium, uh, calcium or whatever, or what, what do you call it? No, I think potassium is this one. Uh, I see, oh, it's that one, potassium. See, I always forget what you call it in English. But anyway, this massive bump here is um, labeled Fe, and that's for iron, okay? And what you conclude when you see the spectroscopy um, uh, image is that this black hump here is mostly iron. It's a block of iron, okay? And this is massive, and it's really hard, and it's really dense because it's a block of metal. Now, at that point, you already have to explain how a massive block of metal ended up in Melanie's throat, okay? So, but it doesn't stop there. Um, so, if you scan, so if you scan the sample, this image is going to move le um, left or right, up and down on on the surface of the sample. And then we saw some really interesting structures because we also saw these massive. Can you see this white line here? Now, when we analyze that white line, okay, there's a bigger hump here because there's more background. But we saw suddenly a hump here, and that's titanium. So this, this white line looks like a fiber of titanium. And that's most certainly not biological. And we had other structures like that. For example, this one, again, we zoomed in on a white structure in the sample. And here you can see it looks almost like the, you know, like the Swiss Alps from above. You have lots of white fields. And every single one of those white fields, so the beam is now right here where the little circle is, showed massive amounts of titanium. And titanium does not appear in these quantities in the human body, like ever. But titanium does appear quite a lot when you have implants, even when you have artificial hips, hips and stuff like that, so regular implants, because it's very biocompatible. Okay, so the human body can take titanium, it can accommodate titanium, it doesn't reject it. That's why it's very, very good. And suddenly we realize this entire sample has these huge, massive quantities of titanium. So that already puts pay to the idea that this would be biological. But then there are other structures. For example, I'm not sure if you can see on this um, on the camera, but here you've got something that almost looks like a hair, you know? And kind of this is um, up, so it comes out of the sample, and there it goes, it dives down into the sample. And these hairs, as it turns out, were to a very large um, fraction sulfur and calcium. But you can see that there are many of these fibers literally going going around here. And then next to it, you have these, you know, titanium fibers. So that was very, very interesting because you have to first explain how it comes about that, you know, the body would produce these sulfur fibers. Um, and then I think the last image I have here, again, this is one of these white blobs. So this is the hair you've seen, um, you know, just now. And then next to that, you have this titanium um, blob, and you can see massive amounts of titanium, massive amounts of sulfur, and also iron at that point in the sample. And this combo is most certainly, absolutely most certainly not, um, you know, biological. So um, at that point, it was pretty much settled, and um, we were 100% sure that um, whatever was in Melanie's throat was most certainly not biological. But um, now this is an afterthought, because um, this is... So, Everything I told you so far is fact, okay? This was us sitting in the lab, analyzing this thing. I was sitting next to the researcher who was operating the machine. And what you saw were screenshots. So you just saw what we saw on the computer. But now let's think a bit because Melanie explained to us that this device, okay, it looks like a black piece of whatever, right? Was around her throat and it was strangulating her but by remote control. So how would that work? because I still don't understand. And the one theory I have, having seen the sample, when you look at the sample under the microscope, 
you can see these titanium fibers, they literally go into the sample and they are everywhere, almost like worms, you know, going through the sample. They're not worms, they are metal, okay? But um, they also come, so the exact admixture of what titanium is combined with is not quite clear yet because we couldn't do that testing. But I, so this is now, at this point, it's my personal theory or hypothesis or whatever, or theorizing, whatever you want to call it. Because I know for a fact that there are certain metal alloys that have this um, really interesting um, property that when they're exposed to heat, they change shape. But they, can, they are changing shape back to, to a shape that they were so-called trained to uh, adopt. Okay, so you work a metal, you kind of beat it into a shape, and then you do something to it so that it memorizes that shape, and then you make it straight again. You know, and when you expose it to heat, it just jumps back into original shape. And I once saw a doc documentary where somebody used material like that, and it was literally just like a long, thick wire. And what they did is they just dunked it into coffee, and the heat of the coffee made the metal jump back to its original shape. And when they pulled out this wire, and this was a real experiment, the wire had curved itself into the shape, I love you. You know, because that's the shape that they set it to before. Now, I know for a fact that materials like that exist, and I also know that whatever's in here is military technology, so some funky stuff that there's even a patent on. So we have to look up the patent, and we have to reverse engineer how it works. But one, you know, what I'm trying to do is make it plausible and understandable for people that this can be a strangulator. Because if some metal alloy like that is in this thing, then all you have to do is put it into somebody's throat, right, around um, the air pipe. And then when you microwave them, the metal fibers will absorb a lot more energy and will, you know, heat up. And then if you've got any metals like that, the metal will then jump into the shape, into whatever shape it was, um, you know, trained to adopt. So anything that has this shape, if you heat it, it might suddenly clamp down on it with quite a lot of force, you know. And voila you have a strangulator and as it cools down it slowly goes back but you can in principle cause an instantaneous um you know strangulation effect yeah, so but that's what it does it actually it contracts the windpipe and so yeah <laughs> and it was being progressively done so um this first operation was my hired bone was really um first i mean i was went to my doctor various times to my ENT doctors to complain about it. And when he saw the last uh, x-rays, because we did x-rays on a regular, uh, the regular interval, he was like, okay, now I need to get you into the university clinic and they have to operate you because this is getting now really serious. This is, this is a serious indication of a, of a strangulation going on right now. So it is, it is shaped to con construct your windpipe actually and to, to choke the, the victim basically. Yeah, to, to, to kill you to, uh, slowly. And, and I want people to really pay attention to this because one of the things that Swiss intelligence did to me, so as Melanie already explained, last week when I was in Belgium, I went to the same doctor who has, um, you know, spotted the laser surgery scars on her body. And he confirmed that I've got scars on my navel, as I already published the scar image. Um, he also saw um, scars on the sides of my breasts, and I already published the, um, um, you know, with the bug detector, the frequency emissions. And then the third one is he said, you have scars on your neck. And I, I'd never, no one, nobody has ever said that. But three days before I drove to Brussels, every single time you do something to um, help the victims or uncover crime, the intelligence agencies mutilate you or they torture you. And suddenly Swiss intelligence started something completely new, which is suddenly they woke me up in the middle of the night with a shot to the head, so like a pulse. And then they started constricting something on my spine. And it felt like I'm either I get my neck broken or my, my spine is being slowly pushed out of alignment. It was agonizingly painful. Literally, you're just writhing in pain and you're literally you think I'm going to pass out. It's so painful. And they did that for three nights. Um, before I drove to Brussels. So, you know, on the, on the, after the third night, I drove to Brussels absolutely exhausted. Because of this, I couldn't sleep. But this is so important for people because remember what the intelligence agencies are trying to do is asset strip. Asset strip absolutely everybody with money. So all they have to do is put in, I never, nobody in my family ever saw the laser, laser surgery scars on my neck. They just come in, 
at night, they put something like that in, it self-assembles inside your neck, you know, mm -hmm. and then, or anywhere else on your spine, and then they can suddenly cause you agonizing spine pain, and they can choose when they do it. So you can be out doing sports, and they just trigger it remotely, and suddenly you think you have dislocated your spine doing sport. But actually, no, there's this, you know, strangulation device slowly distorting your spine, causing you agonizing pain and causing you to incur massive medical expenses and making them rich. So I think this is the business plan behind this. And in, in Melanie's case, they were going for, you know, I mean, come on, you know, everybody understands the sort of sadist sexual appeal of strangulating a woman, right? That's like a big business, you know, in the porn industry. And, and that's the stuff that they are doing. You know, but there's also more serious stuff where they will go into um, elderly people's homes or rich people's homes or anybody who stays at the hotel. They will just break in, anesthetize you. You won't notice necessarily that you have this in, and they will cause you agonizing pain. So this was a massive, massive breakthrough, I have to say. Yes, absolutely. And I really want to underline and highlight that. And I'm so grateful, Melanie, that you have come forward and you're sharing this information about this implant with all of us. And really with the whole world. Because well, what this proves beyond it doubt. It's supposed to be a group uh, working in the general interest of the public, right? So. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And you are totally typifying that and standing up for that. Uh, mm. Because what this proves to the world is that the intelligence agencies of the world that are running so-called surveillance operations on the world, supposedly protecting all of us in our countries from terrorists, these intelligence agencies are, in other words, acting like terrorists. They are running domestic terrorism operations on us. You know, they're stealing into our rooms and our homes and our apartments at night. They are using drugs and, you know, they are famous for drugs. We can go into the history of the CIA and see how well they've spent decades perfecting the art of using drugs to overpower humans. Exactly. They're using drugs. And they're cutting open people's throats and hands and arms and legs and sticking implants in. And this particular implant, I mean, it's deadly. It's so huge. And it's working as a strangulator. How much more insane can one get? Yeah. And I think, you know what, this thing, now that it's analyzed, now that we have the full chain of integrity for this thing, what this actually is, is this is a charge for high treason, for torture, and the intent to murder by strangulation um, against Jacques Reyes, the head of Belgian intelligence. That That's it. This is like the high treason charge right here. In it his is. Face. It is. And you know what else it is? Because Melanie has been the subject of major assault, right? It's also conspiracy to defraud her in many ways and to, yeah. to frame her, to frame her as mentally unstable and to frame her as unfit to take care of her child. Oh, yes, so actually, that's, that's such a good point, Ramola, because um, I'm not sure if people knew, but when Melanie started complaining about being strangulated by implants and by torture from all the other implants she has, um, they tried to label her mad and they have taken her son away, the care of her son. And um, you know what her and I were fighting for is for, for her to get her son back, you mm -hmm. know, and um, she's also now um, pregnant with her second child. And we're also fighting to have that second child, you know, safely delivered because Belgian intelligence have been irradiating her, her stomach, her belly uh, for the past couple of months. They have never stopped um, yeah. torturing Melanie as a pregnant woman. And when I was in Belgium, I was in Belgium several times. And one of the things that's striking um, and Belgian intelligence has done it to me. They have now irradiated me and Melanie's flat. We also measured um, Melanie's irradiation. I've got a high frequency measurement of, of her body in front of my eyes where my measuring devices went nuts. Um, they also, what they did to her, she says she, they do it regularly, but what they did to me is irradiate my lungs so hard that it took my breath away and I couldn't, I couldn't breathe from pain. That's something I've only experienced in Melanie's flat. And they did that. And uh, with that, I personally have a, a, a claim against the head of Belgian intelligence as well. The other thing is that I could see how young people were being trained up on the torture and mutilation of Melanie. Um, every time I left the house, there were stalkers, demonstrative stalkers. Mm. You know, it was usually older guys with hordes of young people in their early 20s. Absolutely hordes. And I want to say to the Belgian people, you either stop Jacques Reyes and his Nazis now, 
or I'll tell you what happens, these degenerate teenagers are being trained by these serial killing psychopaths how to use electromagnetic weapons and how to give everybody in Brussels cancer. And, and you know what? It, Brussels is awash with money because there are all these government officials. And I tell you one thing, these people don't care. They just want your money. They want you to go into cancer therapy and then their companies who are running chemotherapy and all that, they'll get the money off you. That's the business plan. You know, and I saw some of this absolutely abject scum myself. And thank goodness I've got some of the, their photographs. But everybody has to understand that even if they are not targeted, they just don't know it. They are targeted. These people are being trained to target everybody and especially the children. Mm -hmm. You know, And yes, I, I would like to add to that because as we were talking about earlier, you know, people who are not overtly targeted and who do not recognize that there are electromagnetic pulse shots are impinging on their bodies. Those people who do not consider themselves targeted and yet start developing deadly diseases without cause, all of a sudden may not know it, but we know that there are people operative in every street and every neighborhood using directed energy weapons portable directed energy weapons on civilians. We know it. We know it for a fact. We can stand up in any court and we can testify that this is occurring. And if it's occurring to us, there are so many ways in which it can be occurring to you too, and you just don't know it. You may think it's a medical condition that you, go, that you need to go see the doctor about, but you may not know that you are being targeted in a very precise way on a specific part of your anatomy to induce a medical condition in order for you to become a patient within the vast medical system, healthcare industry, so that you can become a source of funds for them, of continuing funds for them, right? I mean, that's just one of the ways in which everybody is being targeted. There are other Oh, I think Melison's trying to say something. Melison, I can't quite hear you. She's got two icons, so I think yeah. she tried to reconnect and there's a problem. Oh, I see. Yeah. And um, actually, yeah, we will get on to Melison's case as well. Um, could you just briefly in the process just mute the microphone just for now until she um, she comes back online? Because I just... Um, yeah, I have a comment as to another method which they're using to um, spray the entire neighborhood of anybody's neighborhood. I mean, there are um, mobile directed energy units, and they will put them in cars, and they will power them with the car engine. Um, but there's something else that they're doing that I don't think we've covered. Uh, in two separate locations, one in Tallahassee and one in Columbia, Maryland, I've noticed that there are two two different homes that apparently were tempested and to tempest is to put materials in the room where you have a certain type of computer and you tempest that so that people don't see the lights and they cannot pick up the emanations from outside the house to see what you are doing and to see the incredible amount of power that is being utilized in that room in your house that is far beyond anything that a normal computer or no normal home would use. Well, what's going on there is that somebody has a computer that is connecting to a satellite. And they are using that connection to uh, send emanations from the satellite to transducers that they have placed in the home or in or outside the home of somebody that they are targeting. But they also do things like they will take those transducers and they will put them along the street or any type of area that that person walks in or maybe bikes in. They'll say, hmm, this person walks around Lake Jones. So let's put transducers all around Lake Jones because when so-and-so walks her dogs around Lake Jones, then we will hit her doing that. Well, they're hitting everybody else doing that too. And now the person who's being targeted is more likely to feel what they're being hit with because they have most likely had either chips put in them or nanoparticles injected into them so that they more acutely feel these emanations and they more so more rapidly do damage. But those transducers are going day and night. 
so that at any time, if the person walks at two in the afternoon or two in the morning, they are still hit with the transducers that are constantly producing those electromagnetic emanations. So they are literally spraying entire neighborhoods with this to hurt the one person, and they don't care that you live there, and they don't now have a beef with you. They don't care if you're pregnant. They don't care if you're 88. They're going to kill as many people as it takes to get their one target for the payoff. And I think Catherine had something to say earlier uh, about the kickback from some of these mobile devices that people think I put, you know, I'm just going to put it up against the wall and I'm going to hit my next door neighbor. He or she will never see it because it's inside my home. Well, guess what? And I'll let you take it from there, Catherine. Absolutely. I, I, brilliant that you pointed out because um, I, um, what we're going to release next week is also a template letter that you can give to your neighbors. And it's basically putting them on notice for crimes against humanity that they are committing. Um, and we'll formulate it such that you can give it to all your neighbors, um, not just the guilty ones, and you can stay neutral. I mean, you, you can keep the evidence of which of your neighbors is hitting you to, um, for the court cases, but you can put the entire neighborhood on, on notice. And one of the things that will be included in that letter will be a diagram explaining to people, because most people don't understand physics. Um, it will be um, explaining to them how actually the perpetrators are irradiating themselves um, as much as you and sometimes even more. And they're also irradiating the entire neighborhood. So I know for a fact that my neighbors here in Zurich, um, they have set up, several of them have set up electromagnetic weapons. But by shooting at my house, they're shooting at um, several other houses as well. And the way this works is that every time you have an electromagnetic wave, a pulse or whatever, um, if it hits an actual boundary, um, and this is a boundary between, you probably remember from your school physics, like when you have, um, you know, a water, uh, sorry, a, a beam of light hitting a water surface, um, part of the, um, the light will go through into the water. This is why underwater you can sometimes see people standing next to, um, on the rim of the sim swimming pool. But also another part of the radiation will be reflected off the surface. And that happens every single time when there's a density variation between two mediums that um, an electromagnetic wave travels through. Now, with visible light, you know that if you're standing and you're looking down on a water surface, if the water is still, you can see things reflected. So quite a lot gets reflected, but quite a lot still goes through. But when you have microwave um, radiation from weapons and you have brick walls, what happens is that almost 50% gets reflected. So this means 50% of the radiation is hitting the person inside. So half the radiation and half the radiation is hitting somebody else. And depending on the angle um, of the shot, this could be if it's straight against the wall, it's right back at the perpetrator. You know, so I what I've seen is that perpetrators set up um, guns, for example, in, in windows and in transparent materials, and then they're hitting a brick wall or maybe your window. Now, when they're hitting a brick wall, as much as, as you're being hit with also gets back at them. So it's exactly the same, um, the same principle that Karen um, talked about when the police officers were holding radar guns and ended up with cancer. It's because some of the radiation goes forward, but some of it gets reflected inside and, and goes right at them. Now, the same principle happens also when you're hitting a brick wall with a microwave gun. 50% almost gets right back at you. So that's one thing. When the shot is at an angle, then 50%, oh, by the way, sorry, this is 84. I'm also being hit with radiation. This is 80, 84 microsievert. This is the radiation alarm, uh, which is, I think, 800 times the radiation that it should be in the room. I keep being hit with roughly 85 microsievert, which is, I think, um, a chest x-ray. So I was just x-rayed um, again. Um, so anyway, uh, so it, by the way, the same thing applies to this bit as well. So anyway. So what I will include in the letter to the neighbors is diagrams showing how if they're hitting your property, then their you know, friend perp, one house down, might be hit as well. And um, one of the things that we know is that a lot of our um, neighbors that we know to be um, perpetrators also have young children. Well, when you're firing electromagnetic guns you know, at walls, um, these shots are bouncing off, and, and actually I know from my experience that the, um, 
I think these are mazes. So these military mazes that they're using to fire the shots are so powerful that after several, you know, reflections, back reflections, even if it scatters a bit, the power is so immense that it still hits you and damages you. Okay, so what this means is that as my neighbors are firing these microwave, pulsed microwave, um, you know, guns at me, they're also shooting into their own children or shooting into other people's children. So once you have one victim, everybody in the neighborhood um, needs to help us to have these perpetrators shut down. That's, that's the thing. The other thing I briefly wanted to show is, um, Karen, you talked about um, um, these guns being put into cars. And I want to show you there's a website. It's called um, eweapons.de. This is in German, OK? It does have the silhouette of Baphomet uh, there. So you know, I don't quite know what to make of it. Maybe it's meant to be something else, but that looks like Baphomet to me. But the information here is true in as far as it shows some handheld weapons that people can use to damage and kill people. So you can see the size. But down here, it also has, not sure if you can see this, um, the image. Um, maybe I can make the image um, a bit bigger. Um, this is um, the image of a, a car door, okay? And it's a modified car door, and inside the car door is an electromagnetic weapon. And this particular um, ad for this weapon is from the German um, arms manufacturer, Rheinmetall. Okay, so the article here says um, on their website, Rheinmetall um, claims that this weapon isn't lethal, you know? Um, but if that's true, one can uh, one can doubt, of course. Um, but what it says here, uh, so the link is sadly broken by now, but what it says here is that the German weapons company Rheinmetall is advertising the fact that they're putting weapons into car doors. Now, the fact that this is legal and that this Nazi company Rheinmetall hasn't been shut down and the CEO hasn't been, you know, charged with treason, uh, is a miracle, frankly. But I think, you know, it's never too late. Crimes against humanity means that we can go back in time. And the CEO of Rheinmetall needs to be literally dragged in front of a court by all the victims who are being shot at in the street. And that includes me. I was shot in the face, and I'm regularly shot in the face as I'm walking down the street from cars. And I deduce that some of these um, emitters must be in car doors. And the way it works is that the outer shielding on this car is not aluminum, it's fiberglass. It looks like aluminum because it's painted the same way, but it's transparent. And that's something that the private um, investigator, what's his name, Roger Tolsus has um, made public. So this is what it looks like, people, okay? And we have evidence. And remember, remember the name, as the rap, famous rap song says, Rheinmetall. They are massive German arms manufacturer and what I personally would call a Nazi company. So keep your eye on this. Well, I'm going to give you a quick anecdote about uh, the weapons. I discerned from meter readings in the neighborhood in Florida where I was for a couple of years that somebody was using their RV in the backyard to shoot it across the backyards of about five different homes. Okay. And one particular emanation coming from this particular lovely neighbor caused severe leg cramps in, in one night. Well, I ended up talking to two women in houses between their house and my house. And on the exact same night that I was hit with severe leg cramps, so were they. Totally impossible. And I asked the women, I said, do you get leg cramps in the night? And they said, no. Now, I talked to both of them totally separately. They had no idea I talked to, each other, to the two of them. And they confirmed it was exactly the same night that I had gotten the leg cramps. So <laughs> they are affecting every neighbor in between and their intended victim and likely the people beyond. Absolutely, absolutely. And then another thing that I can share is also that there are victim reports where um, the victim is being shot at and the shot is traversing a flat in between. And there were victims who are, you know, um, so the victim heard how a neighbor was just happened to walk through the beam and, and drop down or, you know, hurt himself badly because he walked through the beam. And the reason why that is is that they have to up the um, power to shoot through two walls because only about half the intensity goes through. 
But what that also means is that if you have a 50% loss at the first wall, you know, to have full intensity, you would have to double the intensity, okay? And if it goes down by um, a half again, you would have to have a, an intensity times four on this side. But that means to, to just hit the person, you know, two flats down. When What happens then is that the first um, boundary, the first wall that they might be hitting through, the reflections are exactly 200% of what the victim will get at the end, you know? So in, in these cases where they're shooting through two walls, the perpetrators are getting twice the dose of the victim, you know? So that's another thing. I'll put it into the diagram for the neighbors, but people have to understand how how serious this is. And um, actually, this is something that um, I want to um, point out to people is that what we're doing is um, so special. I mean, what everybody who is now assembled here, you can see the entire team is doing, is so extraordinary because we're all fighting towards court cases. We're fighting to stop crimes against humanity. And we have massive expenses, really, um, because we are doing these special analysis as, as, as research labs. We are, and also as, as Rabola um, emphasized to me, because we are the people speaking out for an entire community we are being assaulted the hardest by these intelligence agencies. Catherine, mm -hmm. just, just before we um, do a little spiel about fundraising, can we just focus for one minute on the whole issue of where these shots are coming from? Because I see there's some anxiety in the chat room about it. And um, there are people in the chat room now saying, no, it's not coming from the neighbors. It's coming from um, you know, mobile platforms and cell towers and satellites. And yes, we do understand that. Um, but it's also connected, they say, to neurochips in the heads of the people who are commandeering these operations, you know, who are being called the perpetrators or the abusers or whatever you want to call them, the stalkers, the, you know, the intelligence agency proxies, whatever. So it's, these jokers have neurochips in their heads. So what? how do we want to tackle that? Because just recently, Millicent and I did a video. We talked about satellites and we talked about the whole BCI system, the brain computer interface system, how it's connected to satellites and how satellites, computers and brain chips are being used in tandem to direct energy and to um, manipulate the brains of people through the brain chip. But that is almost another aspect of this abuse, is it not? Because what we are talking about here is directed energy weapons. We're talking about the so-called non-lethal weapons now converted into portable form or man pads, which are being hidden, as Karen said, in the trunks of cars or the hoods or the front part of her cars. Um, I'm getting all the terms mixed up, the trunks and the hoods. Um, and then, um, where else are they being hidden? They're being hidden in garden equipment, right? And we have some disclosure about that from Siemens, I think, Siemens garden equipment. And then they're being hidden in neighbors' houses. And this is where the neighbors and the neighboring houses comes in. But people are so worried about, oh, you can't accuse your neighbors. So can we tackle that head on for just a second? May I give a couple anecdotes? Ramola, well, can I say something? Okay. Yes, please. In, in Florida, there were two neighbors that bordered exactly on the property. One of them I saw put a device in her sunroom that was merely a few yards from our driveway. And uh, she, had, she had company, the company went over to take a look at this device and device almost looked like a football, except that it was flat on the top and it was on a pedestal. There were slats in it and it started to spin. And as it spun, it sparkled. Well, that was, the device only had uh, slats on one side and she made sure to position it in such a way as to direct it toward our house, which had it been an odd looking fan, you would have it turned around and, in, and shooting into the room, not shooting at your neighbor's house um, through the glass at the furthest end of the sunroom closest to your neighbor. Now, somebody in the home went over to, to look at it and she did this. No, 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 don't touch it. Okay, so I said, hmm, that's very interesting. And so I took a large um, aluminum emergency blanket and I put it on the fence in between the sunroom and our home. Within 15 minutes, she came back, grabbed the device, turned it off and removed it and took it outside. 
Okay. Why? Because if it was something that reflected from aluminum, then it started to fill her house. All right. Here's the second anecdote. The man at the top of the hill behind us was going to his uh, pickup truck, which was parked in his yard, not in his driveway, and was parked close to the fence between his home and our home. And every single night after dark, he would go to his truck, unlock it, and then within 30 seconds, slam it shut and lock it again. Now, what was he doing? It was hard to see. But within 15 minutes, we were feeling emanations from the truck, from that position. And my meter was showing that there were emanations coming from that direction. So I, again, took another uh, aluminum blanket, put it on the fence between his truck and our house, and sat in the dark and waited to see what happened. Within 15 minutes, he came out, opened, unlocked the car door, the truck door, did something, then closed the door again, and the emanations began to recede. And my meter showed that they were decreasing. Okay? So that definitely came from two neighbors. Does everything come from the neighbors? Of course not. But let me give you another example. Okay? Neighbors across the street. All right? Um, I had noticed that there were tree trimming trucks in the neighborhood that were they basically were putting people in the bucket and going to the top of a tree doing something but not cutting any leaves, not cutting any branches. So that struck me as odd. And soon I noticed that when I would walk the dogs in front of the house on the street, that there were some strong emanations from somewhere. Of course, you know, Florida is so filled with, with flora, you can't find anything, you know. So I decided to run an experiment. I went and got a one foot by one foot mirror and I put it at the base of a tree in our front yard. And I kind of angled it up because I felt the heat coming down. So I angled it up and I got a couple other mirrors, put them in the yard and kind of, you know, angled them at kind of blind angling, you know. And I said, well, what the heck, you know, we'll see what happens. And within about two weeks, and I had almost forgotten about it, within about two weeks, I was again going up that road to walk the dogs. And I heard a very strange sound coming from the top of the tree in the neighbor's house across the street. And it was almost like metal hitting metal spinning, but it was slowing. It was very obvious it was spinning fast, but it was slowing and chug, 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 chug. chug. I said, what in the world is that? And I looked all around. I said, why am I hearing a metallic sound outside? And I said, where is it coming from? And I started to look up. And I said, oh, it's coming from up there. And then I realized, and I looked at, at the mirror at the base of the tree. And I said, I'll be darned. That's exactly where the mirror is facing. It was pointed at an angle. And I stood there looking up and listening. And I heard chug, chug 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 and it stopped i said i'll be darned did they put a device in that tree and did the mirror send enough of the emanations back that it fried itself of course that's not my tree that the device was in i could not see it i could not climb that tree it wasn't my property but it was very interesting to me that there was a couple that came from a few houses down later within a day or two stood under the tree and, and pointed up and did this. And then when they saw me looking at them, the, the one man said, and they moved on. You, you guys put that together. I think it means there is a device in the tree and I accidentally disabled it. So I think you can't say it's all one thing. There are many things. And I think, to me, my experience shows there are mobile directed energy weapons. They are hooked to different um, energy sources, like an emergency generator, an RV, a car engine, and they must have pro proprietary battery packs as well. So I think that some of my uh, directed energy weapon comes from satellite, directed from a, a computer and through um, um, 
transducers. And I think some of them are the uh, directed at mobile energy units. Um, but, you know, I mean, there are other ways that they're targeting us. I, I would hesitate to tell somebody, no, you're wrong. Uh, your targeting has to be X, Y, Z. Because I don't have their experience. But I will not be told that what I have experienced and analyzed is not valid. So I will give anybody, everybody the benefit of the doubt. But don't, don't tell me I don't know how I'm being targeted because, you know, I've spent time on it. I don't think I'm a stupid person. Um, and I think the, the analysis is correct. So do please keep your mind open to the fact that you're probably targeted in, a, in, in various ways. And that, that's my, those are my anecdotes for the moment. I, I agree. I'll let Millicent um, talk straight away. I just wanted to put in a tiny, tiny thing here, which is that um, I really think that what they are trying to do um, is because in the U.S., premeditated murder incurs the um, death penalty. I think they're trying to, now they're panicking because as soon as you can prove that um, these shots are coming from your neighbors, he is up. He's itchy up. His time's up. Um, and now I can always see people panicking and it's like, oh, you know, it's just like, oh, signals sent to your head by satellite and you're just imagining it all. And it very much goes with the old, oh, you're just imagining it all. And they're saying it for two things. Number one, they're denying implants. And second of all, they're denying that our neighbors are involved. And um, in both cases, I think it's yeah. because as soon as you find an implant in your body, like this one, it's a free pass for court. There's no way titanium, this funky titanium strangulator ends up in a woman's throat by chance. You know, the military and the intelligence agencies are up, basically. And the same thing when you have these emitters at neighbors. I mean, I have videos where you can, online, by the way, where people can see that something shot at me horizontally and dented my shielding. And just like you, Karen, I've spent ages and I can hear at night, first of all, where the shots are hitting, but the shots are so powerful, they are bouncing around several times, you know, and I can hear what are the two points where the shot is hitting, you know, it's hitting there and there at the speed of light and you just get the bang from two sides. And from the angle, I can work out it's from my neighbors, you know, absolutely. And it's not stuff that I imagine because when I hold a measuring device in it, and that's also up online in the video that's called, I think, Audible Invisible Shots, you can hear the shots, you can see the shots, and I'm putting a uh, measuring device in its path, and as soon as the shot goes through the measuring device, this, this thing just howls, you know? So we know, we know that our neighbors are guilty, and we will go after them, and now it's the delicious part where we're literally going after all these criminals and, and the neighbors as well, and now I will pass it on to, to Millicent. Thank you. I want to validate what Karen is saying as far as the neighbors are concerned. When before the high tech torture there was a, a house built directly in front of my house. The mass the master bedroom of the house that was built was exactly in front of mine. And once the high tech torture started first o'clock he got up about two or three in the morning, night, I would be assaulted. But specific about the house, in that it seemed to have been built, a, a holodeck or something in the garage. And it was the only house in the neighborhood with the garage. And there was something connected to his truck that was directing energy to my home, so much so that it, it ate the paint off of the hood of the truck. And it was a fairly new truck. There wasn't like, you know, something that was much older model. Paint was eaten off of the hood of the truck. So that makes me know that someone actually was doing things across the street. Um, he would try and intimidate me as well. The other thing that was suspicious is that his truck had a California license plate on it. So it's like they literally moved someone from California to my neighborhood so that they could start the targeting against me or, or start the behavior modification or whatever it was. Um, we were able to track him down in California. He was from Chino, California. And that was the same town, I believe, that there is a, a an Air Force museum 
interestingly enough, when I moved, he moved. They moved. I agree with Karen yeah. that it was certainly are involved. Someone brought a a a technology into our church one night. It absolutely looked like it could have been a microwave or a piece of could could be used to direct energy. I was told at one point that the sheriff's department uh, would give things to young people, be able to target people. I don't know if that's true or not. I was also told at one point that the police department would give young young people guns and do shoot up in neighborhoods. I still don't know if that's true or not. I pray that it isn't. Uh, that neighbors are definitely gotten involved. For my targeting, the primary uh, perpetrators initially, the ground, the, what they call the foot soldiers, were, were Hispanic, African Americans, or, or uh, Caucasians that I knew of that were were talk, you know, were following me, but but the Hispanics were quite involved. I told Karen, I, no, I told Catherine, a man who lived from me and on the same side of the street as the guy who was talking to me, um, her home, and and one day about mm, about three months after the targeting I started, it was a Sunday. I was going to be leaving to go to church. The guy across the street in front of me came out and stood in front of my driveway with his arms crossed like this to leave the house. The guy two doors up from him had the funeral home truck parked on the street. So I did indeed leave the house, and that guy in the funeral home truck, Another time I came out of the house and literally they had a hearse parked on the yard right beside my driveway. I was told that when those big white the, the vans with, with no windows in it get behind you that they are directing energy at you by radar. So I would always try and not get, you know, stuck in traffic with one of those white vans behind me. So we really are being, they can be targeted by neighbors and also certainly by chips. And I, I asked Ramola, can you pull that up for me, Ramola? Yes, I can. Is Actually, she... I, I have two graphics, Millicent, that you directed me to. So let me just show that on the screen. One is a graphic that shows how satellites are being used and also how they communicate with body area networks of implants in people's bodies and how the intermediary spots along the way are indeed computers. Uh, via antenna system. So that's the first graphic. And then the second graphic is um, the one about um, implants found in Millicent's body from a private investigator, from a radiology scan. So I'll show the, both of these up and perhaps Millicent can talk about them. So I'll share my screen right now. So this is the satellite one, and any one of you can jump in here and talk about this. One of the things that it shows, the middle picture is what shows the satellite communicating to a satellite or a dish, satellite, which is communicating to some transformers. Another mm -hmm. one that I sent Ramola also shows the involvement of a cell phone and a laptop computer. See, then it's, it's over to the, the very far left. It's what I'm looking at, which shows a doctor computer screen. And I'm not sure who is monitoring the patient who is on the far right. Are they messing with you. Can you see it? Can everyone see it? Yeah, I can, the diagram I can see it now. now. We show oh, okay. oh, right. on, and then oh, it also right. tells about the kinds of data that is being taken from the person's body, blood pressure, uh, sometimes sugar level. It can tell the level of fluid in the body. It, it can tell the heart rate, uh, the body temperature. That's all being done by satellite, I can assure you, because as, as, the, as the patient travels, in the state or outside of the state, they're still able to, to gather that data. And the reason I can tell you that is because when I got to 
um, theory where I was I had my body scanned, she picked up the frequency numbers of satellites that were following me to that mm -hmm. area. Yeah. So, Millicent, can you see you can this see. picture now? Because I've, I've put it up on the screen. This is the one with the sensors that you were talking about, yeah. the blood pressure, uh, pulse, yes, inertial sensor, EEG sensor. And then you can see the remote access and the physician looking at a com computer and information in a medical information database. You've got the, so you've got all of this stuff. Uh, so the, basically these are RFID chips, right? Transmitting via radio frequency, via Wi-Fi. Exactly. Exactly. And, and when you look up, at my body scan, you'll see that I have chips in some of those very same areas. The, the user interface is, is on layer two, and you'll see a cell phone. You see um, okay. heart, so I'm, heart uh, Oh, all right. This is another, um, book. another yeah. graphic that shows how computers are linked up to satellites. And um, I'm trying oh, to find your, ground your graphic. Um, the one that, you, that I had of yours. Oh, there we go. The, here it is. So this is your you. implants. Can you enlarge it more so that it's it's showing more of the body? Pull it down a little. I can't pull down, it down on this particular so thing, unfortunately. Let me try to go back up if you can't quite see it. Um, but yeah. you can see that um, that's 53 places. 53 places there are electronic devices in my body. Mm -hmm. uh, specifically, Ramola, make it larger so that they can see around the outside of my knee. Okay. On on the outside of my right knee, there are at least on the on the inside of my left knee, there are at least, and they both go up into the thigh, up into the uh, uh, just above the knee, and then you'll see there's one that's positioned just below the knee. And mm -hmm. a, the one that's being positioned below the knee in my right leg is being used to stop my circulation. I was told mm -hmm. by the perpetrator that it lose my leg. Now look in the back of my thighs. Those chips in the back of my thighs are being heated. It doesn't matter whether I'm sitting on this chair right now, whether I'm sitting in the library uh, using a computer or in church. Um, when I'm traveling long distances like to, to, to Georgia or to Ohio, my thighs are being heated while I'm traveling. And when I stand, I can hardly stand because of the inflammation from the pain. Now, something else that those uh, chips are being used for is to assault me in ways that can cause... I get threats of all of these things. And I do mm -hmm. indeed have evidence. Uh, in January 2016, an orthopedic doctor sent me to have an MRI of my left thigh, right mm -hmm. in the area where you see that chip on the back, because he mm -hmm. was afraid. He said he thought he might see some indications of cancer starting. Well, we're mm -hmm. a year later, and boy, my, my, my bones hurt when I try to walk. I don't have a clue it's being done. And I do know that Randall said, mm -hmm. uh, whoever uses his voice, that he wants to see me without legs or to die of cancer. Uh, and in the left groin is another place constantly assaulted. That obviously is a place where my my, my flows through up to my heart. It can also be used to inflame the tissue around that artery so that my blood flow properly and it increases my blood pressure. Pubic bone is constantly under assault. The pubic bone is used to produce bone marrow. So you see, this is deliberate. This was absolutely specifically placed. And, and the person who I broadcast, a bleeding messaging broadcast in 2008, March of 2008, said he had placed microchips in my body everywhere that he could, could think to put them in 1999. So y'all, it, it was eight, nine years before it was announced that my body was full of time to torture me. And it was um, five more years before I actually got this body scanned. Also notice that there's a chip in each nurse. That person literally stood beside me one day and asked me, where is your sciatic? 
So you see, he already knew what he was doing or had, was planning to do. But, I, and I knew, I, did, I had no idea, none at all. Notice that all five of my toes on my right foot, in them. And, and in the last three weeks to a month, my right torture like nobody's business circulation, which could cause my toes amputated. A really good friend of mine had to have her, her leg, her left leg amputated above the knee. And someone else that I know had, had actually was diagnosed in her left leg. And mm -hmm. they, they had to take. So you see, we're really set up. And, and that's, I don't believe that these chips in my body is being, uh, is being affected by neighbors. Mm -hmm. Literally set up to be. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, by yeah. satellite. Yeah. Can everybody see the well, diagram as well as medicine speaking? I think, Ramola, what you should do um, is share all our microphones and go through the um, images again because okay. um, I think there's a lot of curping being done. And okay. I wanted to show this. people have a look at what has been done to Millicent, have a good look at the number of chips in her body, and then we're going to reveal who that is and this person. And I'll put my okay. name to it. That person is a serial killer. And he's a, he's a okay. danger to the entire state of Tennessee, as far okay. as I can tell. Yeah, he is absolutely. And so, um, so all right, Catherine. So I think what I will do at this point, because if my screen is showing, let me zoom out and show the entire graphic here. Because what this is is nothing but a graphic of front and back views uh, to to delineate where the implants have been found in Melison's body. These are, are radio frequency identifying devices. They are tracking devices. They are, are transmitters and receivers. And um, so they have been found all over her body, as you can tell, in her head, on shoulders, back and front, uh, the chest, all the way down the chest, going down the center of the chest, to the, near the no, navel. Notice the scar in the middle as well. Yeah, is that what you were talking about, Melissa? Mm -hmm. And then all the way down below the navel to the pubic area, the groin, uh, front and back. Notice how many there are. Uh, notice the scar. Notice the implants in the arms. The several implants in the arms, in the elbow, uh, the knees, all the way down the thighs, the knees, front and back, as Melissa just uh, spoke about and then going down to the ankles and then down to the feet and the toes. So um, I have covered this in an extensive article on my website, The Everyday Concerned Citizen, and I recommend that every, anybody who is new to this case, please go in and read that article because there is much disclosure in there about these implants, how they were discovered, who scanned them, how this information has come to light, and a great deal of disclosure around this man who actually implanted Millicent, confessing to his having implanted Millicent and confessing to his intention to literally destroy her life, destroy her body, induce cancers in various parts of her body, and to essentially kill her with the use of these implants. So we are talking about an absolute psychopath. And it, you know, so this is this is the basic gist of it. And perhaps at this point, I'll stop sharing and I'll turn the screen over to um, to Catherine so she can pick up. Yes, and and yes. you know what? Everybody should um, have a look at this video of the tech, today's tech or crime fighters. Go back and have a look at that still image of the chips um, that um, the chip locations that Ramola just seen, which is from a um, an, a private investigator who reported, you know, scanned Millicent. And she does a lot of scans. Um, I have seen several of these scans by now. And I can confirm that the chip locations are always in the same places. Um, there are some have places elsewhere, also chips, like I have also ones in the neck. But I certainly have the sites that are highlighted there. I can feel them. I also have measurements from my own bug detector. And one of the things I can tell you guys is before they started torturing me, I never knew I had chips in me. So what this means is that the intelligence agencies went around and they have chipped a lot of people. Their idea is to chip every man, woman, and child, and every animal, and every everything breathing on this planet. 
I think by 2020 or 2025, something stupid like that, they want to have a catalog of abs not just a catalog, a control mechanism on every living organism. And Millicent also pointed out that it was Ronald Reagan who signed, it was called the Emigration Control Act of 1985 yeah. that permitted. So Millicent is an excellent researcher and what she uncovered blows the mind. And I didn't know that, but she drew my attention to the fact that the emigration and notes, as Millicent pointed it out to me, it's not the immigration, it's Emigration Control Act. It's the people who tried to flee the Nazi camp of the US for them um ronald reagan in 1985 signed this act which allows the chipping at birth so as millicent i think rightly pointed out as soon as it was legal you can assume that they've been doing it for quite a number of years but from 1985 onwards they could chip every newborn baby in the u.s legally so we uh, it needs to be noted though seeing the body scans of at least a dozen people and only three have as many chips as I do. When they are chipped just for military medical experimentation, they have, I, at least what I've seen is they have no more than 10. So between six and 10. I have 53 locations. And those were just the uh, locations where she was able to actually measure the micro Tesla or apply to each of those. And there were specific units applied to each of those so that they could do them a, a kind of damage that was desired. However, I have a whole nother set of implants in me, uh, x-rays and MRIs that do indeed reveal the kinds of, of uh, plants that have been being used on me for I don't know how many years. Richard Kane see these uh, some 14 and he noted he said yours is just like mine only yours must be older technology because they're bigger than mine I have a whole whole nother set that that show them in in other locations but the ones that I show you today my leg I was told by the person that that I believe put them there that he was offended when I would walk off from it Pretty obvious that that's exactly you know that that the loss of my legs or the loss of my mobility was the exact intention and my right kidney uh, that allows me to be assaulted in that area. So the one that that the body scan that was done is much more deliberate. The chips was so much more personal. System there, and that's what makes it seem that uh, whether I'm hearing his voice by subliminal messaging or whether he's walking beside me asking me where is your sciatica, it, it, it just leads to leads me to believe that this is exactly the person that I'm identifying. I think so, Millicent. And I should say that um, Karen, Ramola and I, we all, um, we all had a look at your evidence. We had a look also of the um, evidence you provided about death um, in your family and death in his family. And I can for sure say that they're highly unusual. Also, the list of people you provided of um, people who lost their legs, um, that's also very unusual because in modern day, people don't tend to lose a limb, not even when they're diabetic. So what this also implies is that something horrific has been done. And every single time this person either gloated to your face or gloated through the, the ear chip that we have seen on your MRIs, you know, the many, many ear implants that you have that receive radio transmissions. We already, you know, you have already documents saying there's Morse code as in, you know, um, analog signals being sent to your ear. And um, what I would like to do is I would like to make it absolutely public who this person is because both Karen and I we were trying to get through to the FBI and have this man arrested. And because the FBI is in deep capture, we did not yet succeed. But I think today I would like to put out a call to any police service in the US, um, any military police service especially, to have this man arrested because this man is a danger to the entire US nation, but most certainly the state of Tennessee. And I would like to share my screen and I would make it absolutely public that the person we're talking about is um, Randall Webster here, apparently decorated US um, Air Force veteran but in actual fact, to the best of our knowledge and assessment, 
a psychopathic serial killer who is going around murdering Millicent's community and torturing Millicent. And he has been threatening Millicent over the airship um, with death. Um, he has threatened her daughters and um, her granddaughters, grandchildren with death. And this man is an absolute threat and he needs to be arrested. And there's a second here, he's shown in his uh, um, US Air Force regalia. And here in this image, you can see the man again. You have to remember the face. This man is a danger to the national security of the US and he needs to be arrested and he needs to receive the death penalty for what he has done. And here you can also see if I blow this up, you can see his name badge saying Randall Webster right nicknamed randy which is absolutely apt because all he does is he's living out his sexual perversions in the mutilation of uh, dr Millicent black and has done so for over two decades and this man literally needs to be arrested now because what this man also does he from the u.s air force he received as Millicent pointed out many times seer torture training and um, he is applying that training not to survive combat, but to torture helpless women and children. Um, he's a traitor to the US nation. He's a traitor to his own community. He has been um, let loose um, as a totally disturbed individual on the black community in Tennessee, um, in Colombia, and he's running amok, killing people. And just today, um, as we were on the techno forum, uh, Millicent informed me that through her ear chip, he said to her, that I can't name him publicly. Oh, yes, I can. I have just done so. And if I cannot call him a serial killer publicly because I don't have evidence, well, let me inform you, Randy, I do have evidence. We all have evidence, everybody in my team and many more people, and we will come after you. Um, but what we are also doing is if you're not being arrested straight away, it's because we want to get all of your so-called boys. Um, this guy has spent absolutely years and years training up scores of other serial killers and psychopaths in the use of electromagnetic weapons. They have been mutilating uh, women. They have been murdering men in the community. They've even been desecrating corpses because that's how sick they are. That's all the things that they've done. And they have put others, other criminals through psychopath training. And now they have let these people loose on the population in Tennessee and elsewhere in the US. And these people are now running covertly amok and they are being used for the planned Holocaust in the US because the idea is to use men like him, utter degenerates, lying, deceptive, manipulative, self-glorifying psychopaths, retards, and let them loose on the people of integrity like Dr. Millicent Black. So I want you all to remember the face. Here it is, that's him, that's him. This man needs to be arrested. And what he has done, as I was told, he's also killed several pastors um, in uh, Millicent's community. And he has threatened the entire community there that if they don't, um, if they speak up against him, that they will die. So this is why we're now going via, you know, people who speak up for Millicent and her community from abroad. And I'm now calling on the entire FBI. I have informed FBI Memphis and I have informed FBI Nashville. And if they do not arrest this man, we will make sure that the heads of FBI Memphis and FBI Nashville will personally be dragged in front of a court for high treason because this man is dangerous. So um, this is Randall Webster and we want him arrested and we want the torture of Dr. Millicent Black to be finally stopped. So that's what I want to do. I, I wish we would have named him from the beginning, but now you can go back. And everything that Millicent has said was done by this guy and his hordes. He is using hordes of hackers. He has been given, as he said himself, I think $3 million and a sat satellite to use to assault people. He also gloated to Millicent how he got rich off her torture and some. And he's torturing Millicent right now as, he, as we speak. He has been um, torturing her knee implants because he knew that he would be named. And I'm sorry, it doesn't matter how many people he kills or he tortures, um, we will continue exposing him and he will, will track down all the people he trained. And you know, if we can help it, they'll all be put to death. That's what we're aiming for. Catherine, let, me, let me interject on that. The, um, only statements that he's made to my face 
is asking where my sciatica was. He asked me to my face what I was going to do for a dentist. Those were the kinds of things he asked. In a gloating way. To my face. He, he, also, he also, just to say that he also stalked you um, and you even got a restraint order against him already. So you've already been in court and you got a restraint order against him. I, w I received a temporary order of protection against him. Um, I was denied the permanent order of protection because it seems to be the custom of the court the violence agency that when you come to court, if your defendant has a lawyer and you don't, then she said most likely the cases are dismissed. What happens? Well, let me interject a little bit. Now, I just want to quickly say to the FBI and to the Fusion Center in Tennessee, the Fusion Centers always have domestic terrorism units. Now, maybe they've forgotten that that actually means that they go after the domestic terrorists instead of become them. But I would like to remind them and the FBI that new laws passed after 9-11 deal with domestic terrorism. And if you have reasonable suspicion that somebody's domestic terrorist, they may be picked up and indefinitely held until they tell you what's going on. So if you're going to use perversions of post 9-11 laws to persecute innocent Americans, why don't you take a minute and actually use those laws against actual domestic terrorists? And that's all I have to say. No, absolutely. I think somebody needs to tell the FBI that, you know, this is domestic terrorism. Um, I did. <laughs> I did thrive. Yes, you did. I, actually, you did. one of the things I want to say is that when I called FBI Memphis, they hung up on me three times, and I have the audio recordings. They hung up on me three times, and I had to fight to get through to them and actually asked them to have this man arrested. Then when they didn't do it for several months, I called FBI Nashville, and again, they hung up on me three times. And in the end, by just pure chance, I just happened to hit the number one on the phone queue instead of waiting for the full um, you know, wash cycle. And always do that with the FBI. As soon as you've dialed through, just hit one because then you get put, put through straight to the office, as I've learned. And there I talked to somebody who was um, some secretary type. And I said, the people who are answering the phone queue, are they police officers? And she says, no, no, they are called uh, operators. So what I was up against is call operators who have no idea who basically are glorified, I, I don't know what, you know, summer jobbing people, you know, they were deciding that I cannot make a statement, I cannot actually bring, you know, make a, make a report about serious terrorism. Now, that's the sorry state of the FBI in Tennessee. I think all and the leaders... In Florida. And, and in Florida, and all the leaders of the FBI should know that they do have a statutory duty to fight terrorism. They have a statutory duty to fight crimes against humanity. And when they do not do that, they need to be reminded that their pay packets and their pension funds are not just for sitting around and doing nothing, right? That's the difference between them and uh, maybe somebody who sits at Walmart. You know, the people at Walmart don't, don't have to fight crime, but the people at the FBI do. And when they don't fight crime, they are aiding and abetting crime. And that's what FBI Memphis has done. And I think the, the head of FBI Memphis and the head of FBI Nashville is also up in court. I think what it really means also is that they're really vacating their duties and their responsibilities. They are voluntarily vacating their duties and responsibilities to the American people. They're not answerable. They don't answer the phone. They don't respond to um, you know, information regarding crime and they do not protect the population. So perhaps it really means that this is an obsolete organization very much on its way out. Well, it, that's also covered in <laughs> so many laws in 18 US code. There is a law against people um, not doing their jobs when in, in law enforcement. So they are breaking the law, no doubt. They are derelict in their duties. Exactly. And it is against the law. But I yeah. think all of the FBI is plagued with this. You know, you may have pockets where they actually do their jobs, but all over the United States, they are just, they're pretty much worthless. And yeah. I was hung mm -hmm. up on many times, and including uh, FBI headquarters. So apparently the operators, the phone operators, actually run the FBI. 
I was in court for 2012. Uh, you said to the judge, he said, Your Honor, Miss Black says that she's got a chip in her body. Come on, Your Honor, a chip. That statement, the judge said, maybe I was premature in signing the order. This was January 2012. However, in April of 2012, a cardiologist in Florence, Alabama, did a nuclear cardiac scan, and they did indeed find the chip in my heart. It's documented as, a, as an artifact that is found in the soft tissue of the basal wall of my heart. And let's clarify again for the audience that when somebody in the medical industry says something is an artifact that they found in the body, it means you were not born with that. It is a foreign object. Absolutely, absolutely. And, um, and also I would like to inform the public that um, the chief of police in Colombia, um, Chief Potts, Chief Tim Potts, has been informed many times, countless times, literally every two days, for years now about this and has been sent the scans for um, chips um, that Millicent has. He has been informed by absolutely everybody, uh, Karen, myself, Millicent and many others and he chose to do nothing. So what that means is also that um, Captain uh, Tim Potts is also going to appear in court for aiding and abetting premeditated murder because Millicent also informed him about the other deaths and they just let the serial killer go. So a lot of people are up here. And um, the, the, the term that you taught me, Karen, um, the legal expression is depraved indifference. So it's direction of duty and depraved indifference. That's what these police officers are you know, guilty of, as well as aiding and abetting crimes against humanity, as well as high treason in many cases. So um, yeah, and I hope they all hang. That's what I'm aiming for. And I, I would just like to say that even though it's become fashionable among media today to simply ignore the reports of victims, to simply ignore it, not bother to report it, and, re and name everybody a quote-unquote targeted individual who is a delusional or paranoid individual, I think today we have proved without a doubt that we have absolute fact, absolute evidence to support everything that we are saying today about intelligence agencies implanting people with strangulators, with deadly, the deadly implants, and also people like the FBI permitting people like Randy Webster to go around implanting people and supporting him. And for, for all of this, for more information on this, I recommend that everybody go and reread that article on Millicent, which is a pretty compendious and comprehensive article, which talks about not merely her travails and her experiences, but talks, but pro provides disclosure from various people, from U.S. Marshals, from FBI, from local police, all confessing to this phenomenon of implantation of Americans covertly. They're tracking and their and um, their abuse via satellite, and it also provi uh, provides disclosure from Randy Webster via V2K and via subliminal messaging, all of which are military grade technologies, which which are patented and which can be further discussed. You know, these are not delusions. This is fact, and you can find information in military documents. So disclosure from this guy regarding his part in actually being involved in tormenting Millicent tormenting people in her community and essentially a predominantly black African-American community in Tennessee. You know, it's almost like an entire community has been taken over, an entire town has been taken over by this lunatic. And um, furthermore, um, being responsible for the deaths of certain people, many people. And that's also been discussed in the article. So as Catherine pointed out, and as Millicent kind of pointed out too. So, but go into the article and read for yourselves find out the information that we do have that we're currently working with. And if anybody's out there in America watching this, I do recommend, despite the fact that um, reporting victims are being treated as delusional today, I recommend that you make an effort to take this video link and send it to the FBI, send it to the CIA, send it to anybody that you think might help. I really don't know if the CIA or the FBI will help. I think we need entirely new organizations because these organizations are preying on us. They're behaving like predators. You know, we are all victims of the CIA and the FBI, as well as the DHS and uh, whoever else, a whole bunch of other horrific intelligence agencies and military departments. 
the DOD, the USA, of DARPA, etc. So who is there to, to heed these reports? Because these are reports. These are not deleted reports of crime. So if anybody's out there, if any military personnel is out there listening to this and has an awareness of what to do, please contact us or please help us. Just take this link and you send it to who needs to be informed in order for this kind of situation to be brought under control and to be addressed. So I do ask well, for people. Well, I just think. Well, I wanted to say, not, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, Millicent. I'll just say another uh, another email that shows the uh, transformer in my jaw, which might be the reason for that statement that Webster made to me, asking me what what was I going to do about a dentist. If she could, if she received it, if she could pull it up on the screen, that might be a good a good one because it was actually identified by a chiropractor, and he wrote a letter stating that he found it. I see. Well, I don't have it right now uh, in my inbox. Um, Unless you sent it to Proton Mail, so I'll have to look that up. Hang on. I, I might have it um, somewhere here because um, I think um, I... Millicent sent it to me as well. Oh, good. So oh, good. Yeah, you can pull it up. Um, I can also add it to the article, Millicent. I know I've been behind on this, but I will add all your graphics to the article so that it's on there and the web for everybody to see. Um. Yes, absolutely. And the other thing that I would like to say is that from Millicent, she was told by many military personnel and law enforcement about her targeting. And she put a lot of quotes in, in the article and she mentions a lot of quotes here. And the ones that always stick out for me is that she was told um, by an insider that the FBI knows whose chips are on. So the FBI is mass. No, sorry. So I'm just no, no. No, I'm just say, disgusted. Can you imagine if they knew the yeah. all people three? All 53 so of them are turned on in my body sometimes at the same time? Yeah, but sorry, uh, Millicent, did I get the quote right? I, th I thought you were told um, the FBI knows whose chips are on. That's exactly what I was told. But, but can you imagine if they knew that 53 chips was turned on in one person's body at the same time? Yeah, exactly, exactly. I, I'm shaking my head at the criminality of the FBI. Now, the FBI was brought to task by the church committee in the 1970s for having done COINTELPRO uh, against um, you know, civil rights and women's rights leaders who were just merely asking for human rights. And they were sabotaging them. They were going to their neighborhoods and spreading vile rumors against these people that had no basis whatsoever in truth. And they were hurting them. You know, they were causing other people to hurt them by saying, hey, so-and-so is a child molester or whatever. And they were just wreaking havoc. They were agent provocateurs who are attacking American citizens for asking them for rights that they already had but were being denied. So the church committee examined all the complaints and, uh, against the FBI committing criminal acts against innocent Americans merely because they didn't agree with their political views. And Senator Church concluded that the FBI was warring on the American people and he forbid them to ever do it again. Well, here we go. I mean, it's even worse than before. So I'm thoroughly disgusted with the FBI. You know, yeah, I can't tell them from the street gangs, frankly. It, absolutely. And I think that the, the big problem of the church committee was that um, n no people were put to death at the time, you know. Um, and I think what should have been done is that for, because it's high treason, we have to emphasize is that when, you know, when an intelligence agency or law enforcement agency goes up systematically against their own people, it is high treason. It's the very definition of high treason making war on the indigenous population, you know, and um, literally the death penalty needs to be applied. I'm, I'm totally for it. And um, the people who are running these organizations are total criminal psychopaths and they just, they will not reply to anything else. And, and I just want to, I've just seen the, another quote that um, Millicent just sent us in the chat as we were um, talking in this um, private chat. And I want to highlight this, um, that um, she was told by a young Marine um, about Randy Webster last May, so that's not that long ago, and he told Millicent that Randy's brain is connected to a satellite 
and they, meaning he and his boys, knew how to go in his head and disconnect his brain from the satellite. Now imagine you've got this raving psychopath connected with his brain connected to satellite and, and actually controlling, you know, well, predator drones, if you want to, you know, satellite kill operations. I mean, imagine that's what we're dealing with. And, um, but all of this, it doesn't just go from brain to satellite, poof, like that, but it goes through several amplification stages of signals. And yes, this can be done these days. You know, there's um, already what's called the God helmet, where people can steer and be steered, by the way, through a helmet, they can steer fighter planes and so on. Um, so this is all reality, people. But imagine when um, a criminal architecture has been placed, put into place where a serial killer like that can just go around with that sort of weapons technology. And all I want to say is that the FBI is now in serious trouble because um, to me, what it means is that if this person can control a satellite and, and a militant has evidence that on the day that he came to her home, there was a satellite above her house, you know? Um, well, that means that um, there's an entire architecture, the entire so-called signals intelligence within the uh, US is seriously called into question because you know these these and these information packets have to travel through the entire architecture and how come the nsa doesn't pick this up you know how come how come that they've got these sophisticated terrorists running amok and the nsa for crying out loud can't pick it up well of course they can and of course they put the architecture into place but um that means that the head of the nsa is also up in court and and that's that's what it really means you know Every head of the NSA that doesn't put a stop to Randy Webster is up in court automatically. And I want to, un I want the heads of NSA and um, FBI to understand that unless Randy Webster is stopped, they themselves are in for the death penalty by induction because it, it actually takes equipment and effort from their side that this guy can prevail and that he could prevail for decades. So that's... Hey, Catherine, that was indeed... Catherine, do you have the graphic well, that, that Millicent wanted you to show? And if you could just show it. We also need to be mindful of the time. We're well over time at this point. We're like 35 minutes yeah. past the hour. Yeah, I, I think we also started half an hour late, to be fair. So we're not. it's not that bad, but we're not going to be cut off. But I'll, I'll have a quick look. If you give me two minutes, I'll bring it up. Oh, please do, yeah. So while you're bringing it up so that we can save a little bit of time, I'm going to make a closing statement, and my closing statement is to remind people that companies like Monsanto have been developing hybrid products from wheat to sheep and patenting them. They are patenting living creatures by changing them slightly genetically. And let me ask you what you think that they're doing with the chemtrails and spraying nanoparticles and other things onto us. And I'm going to bring up this question. Are they basically telling the legal system that with all the nanoparticles that we are breathing in that are changing us, that we are now not the humans we were born to be? And now, because we have their nanoparticles in us, do we belong to them? Are we now copyrighted or patented and have no rights whatsoever because we are owned by them? And this is something that you may want to tell those people who don't think that they're targeted or don't think they're targeted yet. Because as, if this is true, then the entire population can be patented, copyrighted, enslaved. So let me throw that out there as a possibility and a talking point with people who are not necessarily targeted with this, but they will be targeted as possessions and property and they will have no rights whatsoever yeah i think i think you're absolutely right oh i've now got um i have now the actual image um from image uh that millicent was referring to and uh, whilst i show you i'll also explain some more things because i think you're right karen we have no rights um we have been defined away from being human and having our own birth rights so let me just share my screen um, and the image that Millicent was referring to, I think, Millicent, am I right that it's this one here where one can see Correct. that in your jaw there's this little um, transformer thing and you can see how there's this coil in the middle and then there are two arms lodging it into her jaw but also acting potentially as small antennas, right? 
into two That's different right. Yes, I'll make it bigger. Hang on. Uh, there's the zoom. That's the finger Oops. of the of the uh, chiropractor that found it actually that actually took away and he did write a letter stating that he had found it and that 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 particular uh, object um, C1 and I've had chronic inflammation at C1 of my brain documented since 2009. That's incredible. So I want people to have a look. So, you know, this m huge thing, right, it's in her jaw. Um, and the people who have, who have put it there really have to, um, you know, I, I'll make it as big as I can. So here you can see the coil and you can see an arm here and then you can see an arm there. Mm -hmm. So that's what has been put into medicine. Um, it's, it's absolutely shocking, um, really. Um, and, and what I wanted to say is that um, Karen is right. Karen is absolutely right that um, we have been defined away from humans. I think it's very insightful that she said that our genetics is being modified and therefore we're not defined to be humans. I think some sort of um, you know, legal quirk like that will certainly be used. Um, one thing that I'm personally aware of um, and um, has been confirmed by um, Karen Hudes, the ex-general counsel of the World Bank, is also that um, at birth our birth certificates, you know, um, are converted into certificates of ownership and are floated on the stock market. So as crazy as that sounds, um, that is true. Um, that has been now confirmed many, many times. Um, and what they do, um, with they, I mean the banks and the people who consider themselves our slave owners, is that they calculate um, our potential um, output, so um, tax payments over our lifetime and all other things, and they will put a value to us and that's what's traded on the stock market. And this is slave trade. So we already um, traded as slaves and have been, everybody with a birth certificate is already in the system. And well, apart from the cartel holders themselves, of course. Um, and um, there are many, many other quirks like that. Um, also, um, I think it has been made public that the entire legal architecture is not what we believe it to be. Um, I think there are also some loopholes where people were trying to get around the common law and are using, um, what's it called, the law of the sea, so um, admiralty law, or whatever it's, however it's pronounced, in US courts. Um, also, they are slipping in Roman law um, and other things, you know, and um, in Roman law, I think I might even have it up. There's one case, um, hang on, I think, yes, this is what it's called. So if you look it up, on definitions, um, uslegal.com. Let me just share my screen because I think this is what's happening to us right now. I think through different contracts with um, the um, what's it called, the 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 royalties and so on. The U.S. and other countries have been sold into um, ownership to the Vatican, which is otherwise known as organized crime. So the Vatican, as I as I said many times, is has been for centuries in deep capture, if not millennia, by organized crime. And so when I say the Vatican, I actually mean an organized crime uh, conglomerate. But um, they are operating under Roman law. And under Roman law, there's something called uh, Capitis Diminutio um, law. And it has three forms. And this is um, how a person can lose their rights their personal rights, uh, you know, in the olden days. So there's this uh, capitis diminutio minima, then uh, the same thing, media, and then maxima. And I think all of us, I think around the world, frankly, but certainly the targeted individuals fall into this third category, which is consisting of the loss of liberty, citizenship, and family. Here, a person's status is changed from freedom to bondage. Um, and in Capitus Diminutio Maxima, is, there's um, the highest loss of status. And I think by some legal quirk, as crazy as that sounds, we have been pushed into that category, certainly in the minds of the cartel holders, if not legally. And that might explain why um, you can see 84 or yeah, 85 um, microsieverts being again shot into me. So I've just received my second chest x-ray for today. Let me em emphasize that this is all legal sleight of hand. It is not legal, no matter what they say. It goes to constitu go against the Constitution, Marbury versus Madison, pretty much sealed the fact that anything that goes against our Constitution, any law, 
any anything even less than a law is void, period. So unless you follow illegal laws, they are not valid. So stop and demand that you have your constitutional rights and basically tell them to go run, jump in a lake with all of these uh, unconstitutional laws and uh, anything else that they care to throw at you. They're not constitutional, period. And you better stand on it or you're going to lose it. Absolutely. I, I totally agree. And um, in legal circles, I think what's floated is that because some monarchs a very long time ago secretly made agreements to sell everybody in the U.S. into slavery, um, it's valid. Um, and also, you know, as has been revealed, the U.S. is technically an interregnum because they use clauses to put, uh, you know, the Constitution out of power and into martial law sort of scenarios. But what I would say is that if an entire nation is completely ignorant of this fact, you know, you can't have an entire nation operating completely obliviously to the fact that they've been under martial law. And just because two people behind a, you know, a closed door signed an agreement, that's going to, um, you know, change an entire nation. No, it's what it is, is what the intelligence agencies have always done. It's deception. It's a sleight of hand, as you had said, and it's a con. This entire thing is just a con because what the constitution is, it is actually a convention. It's a convention that an entire nation signs up to. And, um, you know, when the majority of people say no, as far as we're concerned, the constitution is in force and should have been in force all along, even going back to 1871, then it will be in force. And what you can do is go to court and say, I want my constitutional rights. And should they not apply, I want you to produce the document, either my slave certificate that you're trading on the stock market or some Roman law document showing that um, you've got rights, the rights to actually assault me and murder me, um, or you should produce the documents that show that we're under martial law. And I promise you, they will not do that because for that, they would have to, for a simple court case, they would have to dig out the fact that they have been lying to a nation of you know several hundred million people for um, you know, over a century, and they will not do that for court case. So what you will end up with is you will walk out with your rights. Yeah, and I should also say this is an issue of human rights, you know, and intrinsic organic rights, the, the rights that we are all born onto the planet with. Nobody can lay claim to you, not even the Pope, even though an ancient Pope at some point in time, you know, wrote down on a piece of paper that he owned the sky and the trees and the, and the air and so on and so forth. What absolute nonsense. You know, these Popes are seriously deluded and they should be locked up if this is what they go around saying. So quite apart from that, you know, so I just wanted to point that out. And the other thing is, you know, the, um, as far, uh, it's not just if the Constitution is not being enforced, I think the, the point that you made is brilliant. OK, ask them to show us our, their uh, enslavement certificates of us. You know, show me in a piece of paper that I'm your slave. Show me in a piece of paper that the entire country is under martial law. Show it to me, and then we'll take it from there. And, you know, if that's what they, they think that they are doing, then, then that is the point at which you have to ask the question, excuse me, what kind of system is this where everybody is enslaved? What exactly is going on here? This is not a democracy, right? And I'm sorry, but we prefer to live in democracies, and we need to take the, st the right steps to move back to a situation of democracy. Sorry, Melissa, I think I cut you off. Go ahead. That's my closing statement, by the way. It's my closing statement. I was just asking Paul if he had anything to say after all of us have been bombarding the airways and all of the space. Well, I think that uh, this is a brilliant discussion. You guys have done excellent research and you've got them dead to rights. I think you've got tons of evidence that they're torturing and killing people. Uh, throughout the world. Uh, the last time that this thing was brought, the deep state was brought up to Congress was the church committee, as uh, Karen said before, and it was quickly shut down by uh, Gerald Ford, actually, because Gerald Ford was involved in the MK Ultra program itself, as testified to by, what's her name, Kathy O'Brien. She said that he was the one that was protecting the uh, child pornography industry in uh, Minnesota. So he had a vested interest in stopping anything going forward against the deep state himself. So he and Cheney, his uh, pit bull at the time, uh, shut that whole program down. That was 50 years ago. 
So we haven't been able to touch those agencies for 50 years. They've had their way with us. They've done away with the Constitution. They just do whatever they want. I think the bottom line is, what do they want? Where, where are they going with this? I think that's what we need to think about. And uh, if we figured out how, what, they were, what they were doing with this, and I have some idea, uh, then maybe we could uh, intercept it. But to show that the deep state is really horrible, bad, torturing and killing people, Mm -hmm. uh, they are, and I think Karen's exactly right. We're not what we used to be. No, uh, and you know, Paul. Go ahead. Where are they going with it? Transhumanism, genocide, taking over world populations, absolute control of the human body, of the human society, of the human state, the human body politic, and the human brain. Total neuro takeover and biorobotizing. That's where they're going with this. This is why they have to be stopped. And this is why people need to stand up and start speaking out about this. You know, and we just happen to be here and we're speaking out, but we need thousands to speak up and speak out. Right. Exactly. Uh, it's an evil plot. We're not human anymore. Every time you eat GMO, and if you live in the United States, you eat it all the time. Most of your food is GMO. Uh, you can digest the DNA, but the RNA stays and it controls your DNA. So what we've become and what they're making us is a big program. And uh, it's, it really needs to be exposed, and I think that's what we can do through this kind of program. Really make everybody aware, here we go, and here are the people that are doing it. And that's all I had to say. I, it's not happy, it's not happy news. But, uh, no, no, but you're kind of pointing us and, you know, the, the, in the direction of the problem here. The problem here is that people are not fully informed and people are being fed a lot of garbage by mainstream media. And therefore, it, be, it falls upon various people working in alternative media, literally citizen journalists who are doing, you know, incredible work putting the information out there. And we are simply part of that wave at this point in time. Terrible, terrible atrocities are being promulgated on humanity and on the civilian population worldwide. Everybody knows this. Everybody who has an awareness or has awakened to a certain extent knows this. But there are some people who don't know it. And so unfortunately, we're still toiling in the fields over here. Yeah. Um, you know, trying to talk about it and trying to bring this to people's attention and hoping that together, somehow, somewhere, the right people will hear this call for help and, and join in the fight and begin to make a difference. Because literally, it's not just a small difference that's needed here. It's a very large difference. The people who are involved are the very big intelligence agencies, the security agencies and the militaries of the world who are uh, establishing, you know, acts of genocide on the world population. So they have to be reached, they have to be educated, and they have to be stopped, you know, so it's a big time. I agree. I, I agree, but um, just to, um, my, my final words is that um, we have to remember that um, even just something like eight months ago, these people were operating completely in darkness. I just remind everybody that um, if you go back to January, we did not have the Techno Crime Fighters Forum, and we certainly did not have what we have now, which is now 26 episodes of two hours of disclosure, literally. And this is forever. I invite people to download these videos, truncate them and republish them as they see fit to really spread the word. Um, so we have that. The other thing that we didn't have is also this deep understanding um, collectively, not individually, because all of you have done lots of research about how the technology works. I mean, um, you know, heck, before last week, I didn't even know what this was, right? We had no idea. And now we know, now we know where to look. It's going to start accelerating. So what we achieved in eight months, we will achieve in the next two. And what we achieved in eight months after that, we'll, we will achieve in one month and then two weeks after that. And it will just get faster and faster and faster. So, um, and, and I want to say, once you have identified as a, um, a head of intelligence, as, um, you know, a, a traitor um, and maybe a serial killer, that's it. It's game over. You know, they, they can't cycle heads of intelligence as fast as we can take them out. 
you know, administratively speaking, you know. So, uh, <laughs> but I, I really think that, um, you know, we're now getting somewhere. And um, it, and also we have to remember that this, this sort of system has been mutilating women and children for millennia. And as we speak now, um, we still haven't talked about all the children who go missing and what happens to them, you know. And, and we will yeah. go after them. And that's basically yeah. it, because we, we, we um, cut our teeth on the cases we know, which is our own cases, and then we reach out towards other people. And I remind everybody that as we speak, children are being mutilated, are being sacrificed in this brainwashed, satanistic, child ritual abuse and so on, whatever they want to call it. It's brainwashed. It's just brainwashed by the intelligence agencies um, to produce control files. But this is happening. And I also remind people that what has already happened in the UK um, is a holocaust of disabled people. It was totally planned. They wanted disabled people dead um, and they just withdrew their benefits. Okay, so that has already happened and we will avenge those deaths. We will find out. We won't, we know who did that, but this time we're going after them, literally. Yeah, so that's an optimistic note, Catherine, and thanks for bringing us there. You're right, we've made great strides and we should focus on that. And you know, as you point out as well, the heads of intelligence agencies are culpable. I just want to underline that point. The heads of intelligence agencies are the public face on this calamity you know, the public face. This is the public facade they present to the world. Inside the intelligence agencies, they are operating like crooks and scoundrels. They are holding, you know, control files on everybody else. They're preventing people of integrity from standing up and speaking out. And they are engaging in mass pedophilia. Well, if that's the case, then we go after the heads of the intelligence agencies administratively. I want to point that out as well. We're here to expose infamy and crime. You know, that's what we're all about. So, in uh, and also arrest, uh, imprison, and put to death by legal means. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Imme immediately afterward, I hope, and so that a complete, you know, cleaning up of all these organizations and the installation of new organizations in their place, manned uh, largely by women. So maybe I should say, women by women who have integrity, morality, and a brain. There. I will <laughs> okay. <comment. laughs> it's been two weeks since. Um, Catherine did the fundraiser with me, the video with me, and I have had many responses. I want to thank everyone that has been helping me to defray these extremely enormous medical costs. Since we've been talking about in this last 30 minutes, I've had some intense assaults to my genitals. So if you've noticed me squirming, that's because I am in, in intense pain. I don't think that's from a neighbor at all. Nevertheless, th those were kind of my final words, is, is just to say thank you to those who have been helping me with, with uh, health care ex expenses. And some have also uh, made contributions to my, my uh, GoFundMe legal fund. And I just would like to say very, very briefly, I won't make it any longer, but I would like to say to people that, you know, to, to be, for us to be able to do all this, for Millicent, um, for Ramola, Karen, Melanie and I, um, we do need funds and we are entirely funded by donations. So you are investing in your own um, safety. I just would like to say two things because I promised also Melanie to say this. Um, if you go to my website, which is stop007.org, okay, easy to remember, and you go to support our fighters, here you will find... Um, first of all, our videos, but also um, donations for absolutely everybody, okay? So uh, Millicent, Ramola down here, um, Karen, and this is uh, Melanie who runs a human rights charity called Ikator. Please use our GoFundMe and PayPal donation buttons. And also for Melanie's charity, <clears throat> please donate because um, if you go to um, ikator.be, because she's in Belgium, there's a GoFundMe there and you can you can donate, you know? Um, and it's very, very important that you do because one of the things that's happening to us is that the intelligence agencies are trying to undermine our, well, our ability to earn money in every way possible. Um, we're fighting for survival and the survival of thousands of other people, um, but we are being assaulted. So um, please, please, please donate. And if you can't donate yourself, please spread the word and specifically ask others to donate. 
um, so that we can continue because this is the ultimate battle and there are not very many people fighting it. So we need your support. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Catherine. And I just want to mention in Melanie's case as well, you know, she's, she's pregnant and she recently reported to us that she's still being hit with directed energy. Can you imagine that, everybody? Can you imagine what's going on here? This is a pregnant woman in the third trimester who's being assaulted by the local intelligence agencies in Belgium, in Brussels, Belgium, right? And uh, she recently had a terrible accident because she was hit to her knee and she literally fell. This woman has been made to fall, lose control of her knee through an attack on her knee. And by the way, that's the lethality of these weapons. We've all experienced how intense they are and how they can literally take any of us out at any time. These weapons are killer weapons. They are lethal weapons that are being touted euphemistically by the military as non-lethal weapons, and they are being used on us. So people need to be aware that we are the ones who are providing intense, intimate disclosure about these weapons for humanity. We are the voice of humanity. We are speaking for humanity. And actually, I also want to say, like Millicent, a big thank you to people who have donated to me so far. Because last week I was so just to open my PayPal account and find that um, two people had, had sent me funds. And I really thank you um, very much because I can assure you the money that you sent is being used uh, to provide shielding equipment for uh, shielding of different kinds for other people. I just send the money out as soon as I get it. Um, or for other reasons, you know, just to buy somebody a meal or to get, give them food. Because some people are living paycheck to paycheck. They're living on disability benefits. You know, they're, uh, they're living on social security checks. They're living on retirement pensions. They don't have money. People who are being assaulted and targeted are, are being impoverished or are already retired and don't have money in the bank so any any little donation helps um and I, I thank you because one of the primary things that we need to do for victims of the intelligence agencies who i must remind everybody are outstanding people people of integrity morality and conscience who have stood up for their communities these people are being assaulted to death with directed energy weapons they're being radiation assaulted electromagnetically assaulted and neuro technologically assaulted so these people are literally in the front lines battling for humanity against these terrible weapons. So, um, you know, thank you to everybody who, who has the awareness and the kindness and, and the money to help, you know, so thank you. Appreciate it. So at this point, I should probably say... One well, second, one second. Yes, okay, okay. I wanna remind people that we have the uh, Poetry Utopia portal these are uh, techniques that can, you can use individually or collectively to relieve some of the pain and suffering. Uh, we talk about it Sunday night at 8 o'clock Eastern time, and we're going to be on there again this week. Uh, we might have a guest, uh, maybe not. Uh, people aren't jumping out of uh, trees to try to well, be on our program. Well, they can't find you because it's and, not and also they can't find me because it's on my Paul Marco channel, and so you know they're playing around with that, but. We're trying to do that to keep that uh, portal alive. And uh, I investigate, I, I've been investigating at the end some of the reasons why they might be doing this. And I'll get into a little bit more of that at the end of Sunday night's program. So if you have time and you're just sitting around Sunday night and you want to be, I'd say entertained, but I don't think it's really that entertaining. Maybe inspired. It's pretty in, informative. <clears throat> informed. Informed. Mm -hmm. And yeah, inspired. If you want to figure right. out what's going on with the world, you know, how the universe works, absolutely tune in. At what time was it again? Sunday night? Eight o'clock, eight o'clock Sunday night. And uh, I, I, I will go into, I've been spending all this week looking into how this whole good against evil thing got started and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, how it's unrolling and what stage we're in now. And, mm -hmm. We'll talk about that. I, you know, I don't know anything other than, you know, what everybody else can know. I don't have any line to anything. But, but I, I we'll think you have a, you have excellent deductive skills, uh, Paul. It has to be said. So I would like to, so for the people in Europe, I would like to point out that you probably mean eight o'clock 
is that east coast time or is that mountain time yeah east coast time east, east coast, coast time. time so that for us is 4 a.m <laughs> monday morning 4 a.m oh, but that being I'm sorry, monday night. I'm sorry. i don't know no no that's okay that's okay monday night people tune in tune in and you know you should you should really send a, a link is that on your pine cone? no it's not pine cone utopia is it is it on pine no, cone utopia not. we can't do anything on pine cone because they they've thrown us off a of pine cone because we're we're bad wow. influence I, I, but are your old videos still no, up? No, we there? have we have Pinecone channel, but we can't use the uh, hangouts. Hangouts. So, so I have to use my channel, Paul Marco, to do it at night, and then uh, and then we uh, reproduce and put it on Pinecone Utopia. But if you want to listen to us live and get involved in the chat, and we we you know we have the old the old favorites coming on the chat people that uh, like to talk about this stuff. And uh, we'll try to delve, see if we can delve deeper and find out why, why they want to do that. I think, I think- Beyond the obvious time. reason. Yes. Yeah, I, I think it's high time because I've, I've, just, I've just received a message from uh, Millicent who says that um, Randy Webster, who has this, he can talk into her ear chip uh, by radio transmission says, that uh, okay, so that I, shall I call him a pedophile? Is that what he's saying? Because he said he admitted he that he's. It sounds like he wants to be called a child sex trafficker instead. That's good. I, I think he's, he's not both. A I like to call him a dead man walking. Yeah, that's what it is. It's a dead that's man what walking. It is. Yeah, because exactly. if we so don't ready. get him, the people he works for are going to get him. He's a dead Absolutely. man walking. Absolutely, we because should, you know we what? Read out Millicent's comment right there. Yeah. Oh yes, yes, because she she wrote. Randy Webster says you are calling me a pedophile, while he has admitted that um, that he's setting up a child sex trafficking ring, and that he hypnotizes the children to leave the school to be taken to service perverts. Don't forget, um, the Air Force is in the Mount Pleasant school system, which is Webster's alma mater. That's right, actually. Yes, Randy Webster, imagine as a pedophile, sex trafficker, and, and serial killer, and a dead man walking, thank goodness, is running a school in Mount Pleasant, right? Or is involved in the school, not exactly directly running it, but is involved and has access to children. And I would like to point out that you should go through all these, um, you know, because if, if Randy Webster is doing that, just imagine what um, heads of Intel can do. And I would like you to go through all the intelligence agents, you know, high up um, and look at how many people have got access to school. I don't think any of these guys should come within a, you know, within a mile of a school, frankly. But some people are governors of school and just imagine, just imagine what those people are doing with the children. Okay. I'll so, tell you what, I'll tell you another thing to imagine. Imagine all the perverts that have access to Randy Webster. Because in order to get into this program, you have to at least be a bottom. So uh, Randy's not going off unscathed by this thing. He's part of the whole trafficking. He's being trafficking, trafficked. He's being raped. He's having to participate in these rituals where he drinks blood and feces and everything else. So his, his life is not a bed of roses that he might be portraying. Having, having access to children like this. They all, all of the uppers have access to Randy Webster, I'll tell you that. Yeah, I think you're 100% right. In fact, I remember that um, Medicine disclosed that he had, he said something like that, that he was raped in the Air Force. Yeah, I bet, I bet he was, you know, it would explain his, uh, you know, issues. <laughs> Yeah, well, right. my father, my father brought a joke home one time. He was ex Air Force, and he said, "What do you give a man who has everything?" Penicillin. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect, Andy. That's perfect. Yeah. All right. On which note, guys, I think we may have to pick up this conversation another time. So, mm -hmm. thanks to everybody who is watching, and I will. Say goodbye. Shall I click the button finally? Okay. <laughs> all right. Talk to you all very soon. Bye-bye, everyone.